Westside Drive property in Flamborough, which was tabled at our meeting on March 19th. We do have a new set of recommendations, which is provided to you in your um, yellow package. Great. I think we've been apprised of 8-3, thanks to the good work of Councillor Partridge, and uh, in advance of this meeting. So a uh, motion now to approve the agenda as amended, moved by Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? That's carried. Any declarations of interest? Doesn't look like it. All right, a motion now to approve the minutes from the April 16th, 2013 meeting. That is moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? That's carried. All right, I have a motion now to approve the delegation is what I'm looking for. Anyway, the request from John Aarons for item 8.1 on today's agenda. That's moved by Pearson and seconded by Councillor Pesuta. All in favor? And a motion now to approve the delegation request from David Tang respecting item 6.3 on today's agenda. Moved by Clark, seconded by Councillor Clark, or moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor, that's carried. All right, now I need a motion to approve item 5.1. That is moved by Councillor Collins and seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor, that's carried. And uh, good work, uh, the division is now whole in terms of uh, that issue. May I have a motion to receive item 5.2? Moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Clark. All in favor? And that is carried. Moving along now to public hearings and delegations, I'd like to invite Kim Houtmeyers to the podium for her delegation respecting regulations for or ornamental ponds. Did I miss something? To start. Right into the microphone, Kim, if you want to introduce yourself and where you're from in the city, and away you go. Sure. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this morning. My name is Kim Houtmeyers, and I am a 12-year resident of rural Glanbrook. My journey to you began a few summers ago when the homeowners of a property across the road from mine brought in large construction equipment and began to dig up the majority of their front lawn for what I learned shortly after was construction of an ornamental pond. As the parent of uh, four children under the age of 10 myself, I beha became concerned about the risk this so-called ornamental pond and others like it posed to the young school-aged child residing at the home, as well as the young children residing at and frequenting the properties directly adjacent to this one. I was nothing short of shocked when upon inquiring with the city, I learned that there are no bylaws in the city of Hamilton regulating construction of artificial bodies of water other than swimming pools. In effect, what I was told was that as a resident of the city of Hamilton, I am free to dig a hole anywhere on my property of whatever breadth and depth I please, fill it with water, and as long as I do not intend it to be used for swimming, it does not require any kind of fencing. <coughs> I'd like to take a moment to be clear that this is not a personal witch hunt on my part against these neighbors. In fact, my husband and I enjoy a reasonably good relationship with them. Our children are friends, and I'm coming to you at the very real risk of jeopardizing that. They have invested a significant amount of time and money into the construction of this pond, and it does not make me feel good to know that by pursuing this with you, that could potentially be lost for them. However, I genuinely believe there are much greater things at stake than that, namely the safety and well-being of children in this city if ornamental ponds continue to go unregulated. This is the bylaw information for the City of Hamilton regarding fencing requirements for swimming pools. To my knowledge, it is the only place in the bylaws where ornamental ponds are mentioned. As you can see, any artificial body of water that exceeds 300 millimeters in depth and beyond a volume of roughly 4,500 liters requires fencing. You can also see that so-called ornamental ponds are excluded from this bylaw, apparently because they are not intended to be used for swimming. Interestingly, when I mentioned to city officials I spoke with that the homeowners constructing the pond across the road from me fully intend for their child to skate on it in the winter, which is clearly a recreational, not decorative purpose, I was informed that it was still considered to be ornamental because there was no expectation that anyone would swim in it. 
I can assure you that were a child to fall through the ice in the center of this pond, there would be essentially no chance of saving them. For the purposes of contrasting the pool and pond regulations, this is a picture of a swimming pool, which is 762 millimeters in depth and holds 5,621 liters of water. It retails for less than $100. According to the City of Hamilton bylaws, anyone owning this pool would be required to erect it only in their backyard, and even then, it would technically require fencing. This is a photograph of the pond under construction in my neighborhood. I'm not sure that the picture reflects the full scope of this project, but I would estimate it to be 20 feet wide, 50 feet long, and roughly seven to 10 feet in depth at its center. I can tell you that it is so deep that when backhoes were driven into the center, they disappeared from sight. As you can see, or maybe, I don't know if you can see, there are shelves that have been constructed that sort of level down to the center of the pond. And according to um, other neighbors, this was done for safety in the event a child fell in. But each of these are at least two to three feet in height. Regulation of ornamental ponds is not without precedent. In the city of Toronto, any outdoor pool or pond capable of holding more than 24 inches of water must be enclosed. The safety risks ponds pose, particularly to children, are obvious and are very real. This article from the National Post reports on a two-year-old child drowning just last summer after falling into a neighbor's backyard pond in Scarborough. As you can see, because of the city bylaws, the homeowner now faces charges of criminal negligence causing death because the pond was not properly fenced. Closer to home, last September, another two-year-old child drowned in a pond in neighboring Lincoln. These kinds of incidents are unfortunately not rare. It is a well-established fact that drowning is the second leading cause of preventable death in children under 10 years of age, and that a young child can drown in as little as one inch of water in a matter of minutes. I recognize that there are natural bodies of water, including rivers, lakes, and streams, and other artificial bodies of water, such as storm drainage ponds, that many children live around and are exposed to. But I would argue very strongly that the fact that these hazards exist does not eliminate our need to put protection in place when they are constructed for decorative purposes. I'd like to wrap up as I began, and that is to state that my push for regulation of ornamental ponds absolutely does not stem from a personal vendetta against my neighbors, and that I in fact carry more than a little anxiety about what the neighborhood response will be should they become aware of my appeal to the city. But I would reiterate that as it stands now, any homeowner in the city of Hamilton is free to dig a hole anywhere on their property of whatever breadth and depth they please, fill it with water, and as long as they do not intend it to be used for swimming, are not subject to any fencing regulations. There is, no pun intended, a gaping hole in the city of Hamilton bylaws that desperately needs to be addressed. So if by bringing this to your awareness, changes are made that ultimately result in saving even one family the horror and trauma of losing a child to drowning, then the personal risk to me will have been well worth it. I thank you once again for your time. Thank you, Kim. We do have a question uh, from our committee member, uh, Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Kim, for coming in and mm -hmm. uh, enlightening on us on, on this situation. Um, I'm going to ask a question. It's, an, it's a very big hole, as you say. Where did all the fill go that came out of that hole? I believe it was um, transported over to a neighbor's property to uh, correct a slope on their land. So it changed the grading somewhere else, which we have bylaws that control as far as grading. Uh, yeah, I can't. I don't. I don't know specifically. I'm not. Yeah. You may have to ask our staff about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Pasuda. Thank you, Chairman Farr, and welcome this morning, Kim. Thank you. Um, your request came to Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee and we forwarded here for you mm -hmm. to come here and speak. So the pond you're showing, it looked to me, it was almost, it's a pond to what I as a farmer recall a pond being. But uh, I had imagined the smaller ornamental ponds are the ones you can buy in your local landscaping store and things like that. Are you looking at 
those two over all, all these ornamental ponds? You know, I, I think that really we need to consider that if we have regulations in place for swimming pools that the same uh, regulations need to apply to any other artificial body of water that someone puts in. And so, for instance, the regulations um, are that if it's more than 300 millimeters or capable of holding more than 4,500 liters, that it needs to be um, fenced off. And I think the additional risk that these ponds pose is that unlike, for instance, the inflatable swimming pools that we see going everywhere, a child needs to physically climb up into that swimming pool. And so often a two-year-old, including you know, actually adults, would have a hard time in many of those pools scaling the sides of it. Um, the difference here is that with the pond, it's a simple matter of literally just falling in. Uh, there's no climbing involved, so if anything, I would argue that these ponds actually pose more of a risk. But I would suggest that any of the regulations that we have in place for pools need to, need to apply equally to any other artificial bodies of water. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillor, I'm going to pass the chair to Councillor Johnson. I have one question for you, Kim, and thank you mm -hmm. for your delegation. Uh, through you, Councillor Johnson, um, you had uh, mentioned uh, on a few occasions that uh, something to the effect, not verbatim, should the, your neighbors become aware of the delegation. You're, uh, uh, I guess, a uh, little concerned for absolutely uh, yeah. some some neighborhood. Uh, uh, dissension possibly. Mm -hmm. So oh, you, I, I can assume then from those comments that you hadn't had an opportunity then to speak to your neighbor who put the pond in or anybody else on the street before coming here? Well, I mean, we've certainly spoken with them about the pond and it's been under construction uh, quite slowly for uh, the last two summers, I believe, but I haven't spoken with them directly about um, concerns, no. Okay, and you're out uh, through you, Chair, t in uh, the Glanbrook area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can't, I think they're called cisterns or... or can, uh, cisterns, yeah. Right. Is there plenty of those out in, the, in your area? Yep. Would they fall under your uh, concern with respect to this delegation as well through you? Uh, well, I mean, I can only speak to my own sister, and I've never personally looked at ones on other properties. But again, we have uh, young children in our home, including a two-year-old. Um, the way our sister is set up, it would be physically impossible for him to actually get, like, if, even if he pulled the top off, to fit his body into the hole. It's it's only about seven, eight inches in diameter. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, no further questions from committee. Councillor Partridge would like to speak. Please. Oh, sorry, Councillor Partridge. I'll take the chair back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kim, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my question was, and, and I did hear you say that you were out in Glanbrook, but mm -hmm. um, I didn't hear in Glanbrook. Are you out on a concession? Are you on a rural route? We're on a rural route. Okay. Yeah. So you're not within an urban area or a settlement, rural settlement area. That's true. Although I would say that, I mean, I'm assuming that these bylaws that, or lack of bylaws apply to everybody in the city. So I would think that in the subdivisions, for instance, it would be no different. Um, that there effectively is not technically nothing illegal about someone digging a deep hole in their front lawn and filling it with water and calling it a pond. Right, and, and through you, Chair, thank you for raising that because that, um, you know, that that is the, the truth. It, it would be applying to everyone in the city, and, mm -hmm. and I think that could be a, a problematic. Well, this is the thing, because out where we live, it's a little easier because of the space and the distance to regulate things, and I can certainly keep my own child from going across the road, although that would prohibit them from playing with the neighboring children. But I think in a survey where the houses are much closer together, um, it definitely poses much more of a potential issue, including in backyards at that point. Mm. But outside of that, through you, Chair, it would also uh, potentially affect our storm management ponds, yeah. which are quite huge, and they, they are, are within the subdivision areas. Yeah. Um, and currently, <clears throat> unless they're backing on to an institution, um, they don't require any kind of fencing at all. So no. um, anyway, those are my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clark. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not the property where the pond is, Mr. Chairman, um, is operating as an agricultural, is it a farm, or is it simply a residential property? It's just a residential property. So they're not using the water for irrigation or anything like that? No. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. I just um, appreciate the, the presentation, and it only makes sense. I think uh, the point you made, uh, I mean, you can draw, drown in two inches of water. So it's something that we've never really uh, uh, focused on, and 
I'm sure the Lifesavers uh, organizations would probably have their own comments on yeah. on these kinds of issues. Um, you got preventable drownings that you've identified in the uh, in the presentation. So I just want to thank you for bringing that forward. Thank Something you. that never I certainly never thought about, but when you start. Uh, looking at it from a broader perspective, it does uh, create some concerns. So yeah. I certainly hope that at some point uh, we can start looking at reviewing that whole uh, part of the, the bylaw. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Johnson. And thank you, Kim, for coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you feel like you've been bounced around the system a little bit going to Agri <laughs> coming here. A little bit. Uh, Kim, do you have any thoughts about hot tubs, spas? You know, it's a good question. I actually hadn't uh, given those uh, specific consideration. Um, I would say that, you know, living out where we live, it's not atypical for people to even have the inflatable pools and to have them unfenced. Um, and those are, you know, often, however, in someone's backyard, which I think uh, makes a bit of a difference. But I think, you know, really, if we're looking at anything like that that poses a risk, I'm sure that if we were to look in the literature, we'd find out that toddlers have drowned in hot tubs and spas as well. Perhaps the only difference is a lot of those have I believe lockable firm um, hard covers um, that can uh, be snapped on top for safety purposes, whereas something like this pond that I've showed you um, is just a wide open body of water. Thank you. And through you, Chair, I'd like to refer this back to staff for some more information if that's when you come back to me for that. If we're finished Well, you're the final speaker, so would you like to do that in the form of a motion or direction to staff? I'd like to uh, send this topic back to this presentation to staff for an information report to come forward to, with their recommendations. And seconded by Councillor uh, Partridge. Thanks. Okay, thank you. On the motion, it's a motion. Councillor Clark, followed by Councillor. I was going Council. to move to receive this report and then speak to the motion. Uh, moved by Clark, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor on receiving the report. Here. Thank you, Kim. Appreciate Thank you me. coming by. Thank now to the motion, which we have just heard. Yeah, so I'm just trying to clarify what we're actually asking staff to do. Asking staff if there's some options available for this. So we're just asking for options, whether it is to do nothing, whether it is to regulate, and if it is to regulate, what is it we are looking at regulating, and what is the cost of that? And just to report back. Perhaps we could start with staff reporting on what our bylaws are specifically. And we might be able to give them some guidance from there. Just a lot of work can be done on something that the council may or may not be going down that road, and I don't want to waste our time, our staff's time. So, if we get a report back from staff in terms of what our bylaws are, both rural and urban, um, then the committee can give some direction in terms of what their concerns may be at that point in time once they see where the holes are um, in the bylaw. Just a suggestion. Okay, so. Um uh, friendly amendment. So I'm hearing um, Councillor Johnson moving and seconded by Councillor Partridge a review of the existing bylaws should they exist with respect to ornamental ponds as a part A and a B, um, a review of the presentation, I guess, that was before us today with respect to ornamental ponds. And that's moved by Johnson, seconded by Partridge. I believe Councillor Pearson, you wanted to, Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Um, well, I think it, it, it's, it's prudent for us to, uh, I mean, I think that's automatically part of the, uh, the review is what we have currently in place, uh, whether it's covered and it is adequate. And I think the second piece needs to be uh, uh, to understand what other jurisdictions and how they address this issue. Uh, to, uh, to to see if there's a trend in, in, in what that trend is and, and whether or not uh, we find a made in Hamilton solution or there's some things that we may uh, be uh, able to adopt. No point reinventing the wheel. So I think it just a, a cursory look at what is taking place with these kinds of issues uh, in other jurisdictions might be part of that report, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. So add to that, uh, Madam Clerk, uh, provide examples of existing bylaws and trends in neighboring jurisdictions. On that, Councillor Clark. I just might as well ask the qu questions of staff then instead of I'm, starting. I, I think Ed from building is uh, champing at the bit. So a very good yep. suggestion. And if you would like to get that rolling, Councillor Clark. Good morning, uh, Ed. Um, perhaps you could start with um, the bylaws we, regarding um, swimming pools in an urban area and where ponds may fit into those bylaws. 
Yes, and through the chair uh, to the member. Currently, uh, the Hamilton City of Hamilton bylaw restricts bodies of water deeper than 12 inches in deep of water in, this, in the urban area or rural area. For swimming purposes, they need to be fenced. Uh, naturally, we have in town, we have uh, ornamental pools that have goldfish and whatnot. They're currently not regulated because they're normally small in the backyard. They're not for swimming purposes. This one is difficult because in the rural area, we have many ponds that farmers use for horticulture and agricultural purposes. And this pond appears to be in the rural area. So there's this mix of you know, ornamental and rural pond size, because this is actually a large pond. It's not just a little ornamental thing anymore. Although it's not used for agricultural purposes, it's an ornamental pond. So there's going to be our dilemma in the future, where we define properties in the rural area, how we defense them in, because these are large. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, with regards to in the urban area, a pond of this size, naturally, I'm assuming that the property would actually be large enough to put this pond on, but um, how would the city react to having this within, within the urban boundary? Uh, through the chair, it would be unusual for this pond to be this size to be a ornamental pond. I think it would be a swimming pool, most likely. If it were defined as an ornamental pond, it would be exempt from the bylaw. And who makes the decision in terms of whether or not it's an ornamental pond or a swimming pond? It, the building division staff would do that. And so. has there been issues before within the urban area with regards to uh, larger ponds than, or similar to this yeah. size or without fencing? Through the chair, not that I'm aware of. Um, so the last question, Mr. Chairman, would be, does the staff believe that there is a weakness in the bylaw that needs to be addressed? Uh, through the chair, I appreciate the comment, checking whether municipalities do. We'll take a look at that. Um, I'm not sure where the weakness is at the moment. This particular pond naturally will be exempt from any future bylaw amendments. So this pond is as it is already. It's an anomaly, uh, but it's already in, in the ground, as it were. So in essence, it's grandfathered regardless of what we do here. That's correct. How do we treat um, natural occurring ponds and streams? Uh, I'm thinking Stony Creek, um, well, just the name of it itself tells you what's going on there. Um, we have some significant waterways that at different times of the year are fast flowing rivers and other times moving creeks so how do we deal with all the creeks and streams and ponds and items that are flowing through my ward for example uh, through the chair currently the bylaw exempts four different bodies of water first it exempts government owned or agency owned bodies of water so those are your attention ponds it uh, exempts bodies of water for ornamental purposes only it exempts agriculture and horticultural ponds in the rural area, and it exempts all naturally occurring ponds, streams, rivers, and creeks. So if they're naturally occurring as they are, they're exempt from the bylaw. Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think what, we, what I would like to see is that the staff come back and look at the actual definition of an ornamental pond. That seems to be where there may be confusion in the process. Everything else seems, from just a cursory glance, Consistent um, with what we've been doing in the past, ornamental ponds are something relatively new that have become quite popular. Uh, and so we may want to ask our staff to look at actually the definition of ornamental ponds, how other municipalities are enforcing um, that type of um, construction in, in, in urban areas. I am, I have to be candid though, I am concerned about getting into the rural areas because we're, we potentially will be getting into um, <laughs> quite the debate with our agricultural community when it comes to ponds and what I may consider to be an ornamental pond um, they may be using as, as irrigation you may not know because the pipes will be under the ground it's not something that is, is visible so um, that would be my suggestion I would to hear from my colleagues but I think the actual definition of ornamental pond, I don't even know if we have one. So that would be the starting point. And then from there, how would we be enforcing it? Okay. So we can include, uh, I believe the um, request from Councillor Clark is a definition of 
an ornamental pond and that uh, maybe we delineate between the urban and rural when we're, uh, we're getting this, uh, we're receiving this report from you, Ed, if that's fine. And Councillor Johnson, did you? Yeah, and I totally agree with uh, Councillor Clark. And first, I have to, I didn't say this earlier, I have to apologize for being late. I had two meetings this morning and one ran over. So thanks, Ed, for all those uh, answers. That really clarifies a few things for me as well. So I'm, I will totally support the amendment, and that's the definition of the ornamental ponds and what are other municipalities doing, and also the, the urban and rural. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Whitehead, and then we'll have um, Vanessa, our clerk, sort of reiterate what we're, what's before us. I, I just wondering, uh, and maybe that's a, a cursory look. I don't know, I'm not aware, but if there was any uh, inquiries or anything as a result of uh, a death of a child in a, in a pond, normally there's a recommendations that come out of those particular inquiries. So I would hope that would be part of the cursory look to uh, to uh, to see if, in fact, recommendations have come out of any of these deaths uh, as a result of children uh, drowning in ponds. You getting this, uh, Council Councilor Partridge? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just one uh, question through you uh, to Ed. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. Would there, um, where would stormwater management ponds fit into this review that you're doing, or would they? The bylaw currently exempts bodies of water owned by public or government bodies or agencies. And that would include the stormwater management ponds? If they're on private land, it probably wouldn't. I will have to confirm that. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, Councillor, or Madam Clerk, do you want to just, uh, for the record, review what's before us in terms of staff direction and the motion, rather? So, first, that staff be directed to provide a report on current rural and urban bylaws for the regulation of ornamental ponds and provide options on possible rural and urban distinction for future regulation of ponds. Uh, that staff provide a definition of ornamental ponds, uh, that staff provide a review of other municipalities' bylaws with respect to regulation of ornamental ponds, and do we still want that staff review and address the current concerns provided in Kim Hootmeyer's presentation? Councillor Johnson, that question I believe from the clerk was to you and then we'll get to you, Councillor Clark. I think, yeah, and I think that to clarify things a little bit, one of the things that we said was about the urban and the rural. Uh, that was just to clarify between the two. It, first of all, definition of an, of an ornamental pond. Uh, what is the current bylaw for the ornamental ponds? And let's see here a second. What are other municipalities doing? And the part about the presentation that Kim made, and that sort of captures what Councillor Whitehead was saying, was what were the recommendations out of that inquest? part of her, her uh, presentation. Okay, that wasn't officially um, uh, an amendment, but we can add it, that's fine. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Councillor Clark? Yeah, I, what Councillor Whitehead raised, and I'm looking to, to add now, he mentioned um, inquests. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure even the process in terms of how we would start to establish where inquests were or were not, but um, we can um, deal with Queen's Park and look at the regulations that would come out of an inquest. Inquests usually change laws, so if there have been inquests, there would have been recommendations to the provincial government with regards to regulations. So if we just want to do a, uh, contact Queen's Park with regards to any regulations about standing water and incorporate that into the report, that would clear up your search to the courts to find out where there was an inquest. Um. Thank you, Councillor Clark. And uh, finally, I'll just pass the chair through uh, you, Councillor Johnson, who now does the chair. You okay with all of this, Ed? It's uh, pretty straightforward and you'll be able to report back to us then? No problem. We thank you. Please do that. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you again to Kim, who uh, presented here today. and. Um, safe crossing uh, uh, to your children. We can move on now to item 6.2. This is the application for amendments to the City of Stony Creek official plan and Hamilton zoning bylaw number 05-200 for lands located at 1361 Barton Street East in Stony Creek. 
In Ward 11, members of the public, in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council approves the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the Ontario Municipal Board, and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Municipal Board unless, in the opinion of the Board, there are reasonable grounds to do so. So are there any members of the public wishing to address committee at this time for this item? Come on down. Oh, right. You'll, you'll, we'll call you in a moment. Sorry, that's right. Uh, since we do have a member of the public wishing to address committee, uh, we will now look to a staff presentation and then invite the members of the public down. Does that sound fine? And that would be Joe. With the staff presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, staff, and members of the public. The subject lands are located at 1361 Barton Street in the city of Stony Creek, just east of Winona Road and 50 Road, uh, directly across the street from the Winona Peach Festival Park. The purpose of the applications is to rezone and redesignate the lands to allow for a Catholic elementary school. The proposed school will have a ground floor area of 3,700 square meters with landscaping, 68 parking spaces, a lay-by for a school bus drop-off, two play areas comprised of both asphalt and sod, and one kindergarten play area to the rear of the building. The official plan amendment is to, uh, to designate the subject lands from special policy area F to institutional in the Stony Creek official plan. The change in zoning is seeking to add the lands to the parent neighborhood institutional I-1 zone in the Hamilton Zoning Bylaw 05200 in order to permit the Catholic Elementary School. <clears throat> Through review of the application, it was recommended that a holding provision also be incorporated into the implementing zoning bylaw to address issues related to archaeology, municipal servicing, urbanization costs, and traffic. What you have before you here is the uh, is the uh, conceptual rendering of the uh, of the site plan for the school. This is an aerial photograph of the school. Um, to to uh, to the west is an existing uh, subdivision. Uh, across from the school directly is the uh, Winona Peach Festival Park and uh, additional residential development just to the south of the park. This is a uh, photograph from uh, looking from the, from the Winona Peach Festival parked on the subject lands. This is looking westerly of the subject lands. This is the subject lands as well and in, in behind you can see the foothills subdivision uh, in, in behind that uh, tree. Tree, uh, tree line. This is the uh, Peach Festival Park immediately south of the subject lands. And this is uh, looking southwest of the subject lands, uh, the park. In accordance with the uh, new provisions of the Planning Act and the Council approved public participation policy, uh, notice of complete application preliminary circulation was sent out to 53 property owners mm -hmm. within 120 meters of the subject lands on December 11th, 2012, and a public sign was posted on the property on December 21st, 2012. One email of concern was submitted by the Board of Directors for the Winona Peach Festival and uh, it, that is discussed in the staff report analysis, um, analysis rationale section. The uh, notice of public meeting was also circulated in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. 
and the public notice sign on the lands was subsequently updated on April 12, 2013 to provide notice of today's public meeting. In closing, Mr. Uh, Chairman, the, uh, the planning applications have merit and can be supported by staff as the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to places to grow, conforms with the Hamilton-Wentworth official plan, the proposed development is considered to be compatible with the existing and planned development in the immediate area, and the proposed development provides for a valued community asset which meets the needs of area residents, and lastly, the proposal implements a condition of approval for the severance application. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Joe. Any questions for staff? We do have questions from Councillor Johnson. Good morning, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, could you please go back to the slide that shows um, the whole area? If it would, the, if, there you go. Um, just to enlighten my colleagues and remind them, around that yellow s uh, square is foothills of Winona 2, phase 2, that we decided on last week. So we've got the school, we've got 287 units coming in behind there. And that bottom, can you just point to the corner of where the green belt exists still on that piece of land? Right there. So because of 50 Road and because of that green belt, there's not a secondary road that's going to be planned to come out there unless the lands come out of the green belt. So when I sat down with staff to talk about this, I was talking about the whole area holistically, not just centering on just the school. So my concern was traffic and my concern was parking and pedestrian walk. And the park right across the road from it has got an extensive parking lot and this is where I assume is going to happen is that a lot of people will be parking over there. So Joe, through uh, the chair to you, the parking lot for the proposed school has 68 spaces in it. Did we use the same formula for this school as we did for the Winona Public School that just, the Winona Elementary School that was just erected at the corner of Lewis and Barton? Did we use the same formula? Through, through the chair of the, the councillor, um, I believe that school is also zoned for under the 05200 bylaw and there's no modifications required or requested for the, the parkings, uh, parking spaces for this proposal or, or that one. Okay. And through you, Chair, to Joe, the, the new elementary school that was just erected, we have some chronic pro par sorry, parking problems around there. So I'm assuming that the parents will be parking at the park and bringing their children over that way because we have 68 uh, spaces. And how many classrooms is this school going to have? Through the chair to the councillor, I'm not aware of the total number of, of classrooms, but the school will accommodate approximately 504 students. Okay, so when the, when the applicant comes up, I'll ask him those questions then. So my, my concern was if we're going to have parents parking at the existing park and walking across to the school, we're going to have a new development behind there, we're going to have one road coming out, right now it's just called Street A, that I was really concerned about the pedestrian crossings. So can you address that for me, please? Uh, th through the chair to the councillor, as part of uh, the recommendation in the implementing zoning bylaw, there is a holding provision that's incorporated to, that speaks to the traffic impact study that was that was prepared on behalf of the Foothills subdivision you referred to earlier, as well as the as well as the proposed elementary school. Uh, so, with that said. We haven't finalized those those traffic movements. There will be a site plan application that will be coming forward for the proposed school site in the near future. Um, it, it's it's my understanding that um, uh, through discussions between yourselves, staff, and and the applicant, the uh, as well as our our, our crossing school guard uh, section or division, has indicated that there will be a pedestrian crosswalk in in this area here, right. which is almost in keeping or in line with the um, the path the pathway that's currently there right now. Great, thank you. And uh, on page 12 of 20, the last paragraph, it says, the potential need for eastbound left turn lane on Barton Street. Is that still something that we're going to have, that we're asking for? Uh, I, I believe through the chair of the councillor that um, in discussion with the quarter management staff and, and other staff, uh, it, it, it is identified that that may be a requirement at some point in, in the future in terms of the review of the traffic impact study. 
Okay, thank you, Joe. I've had two public meetings on this um, this area already, and one of the things that came out loud and clear was traffic, pedestrian traffic as well as vehicular traffic, and um, safe. Safe. How do we how do we make this safe for everybody? So my last question is through you to Tony. Tony, there was some extensive speak um, topics, or sorry, Gavin probably be more appropriate with this case because we were talking with Gavin at the Foothills uh, Phase Two. There was this long discussion about how the swim pond and the size of the swim pond for that development. And I noticed that on, in your uh, comments, was that uh, we could not allow any new development to create or exasperate downstream flooding. So in, in talking with that, what are we going to do for the swim pond, if any, on this site? Or are we going to have foothills of, of Winona Phase 2 accommodate that flooding issue? Through the chair, uh, Councillor, the um, stormwater management is being uh, dealt with on the school site in twofold. The quality component for dealing with stormwater quality is it will be handled on site. The uh, future pond being built for Foothills and Winona Phase Two will will handle the quantity requirements for okay. the uh, school site. Thanks. And that was for the folks at home because that was also another issue. Um, so thank you. Those are my questions for now, and I'll just wait for the applicant to come forward. Thank you. Councillor Thanks, Clark. Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Boodle. Um, normally, when we have special policy areas, we go through um, a comprehensive review before we actually move forward to um, developing the land into to, uh, secondary plan. So has all of the work been completed with regards to this property? Through the chair to uh, to the councillor, um, with respect to the special policy area F in, in this area of Stony Creek, this was formerly the Scooby Lands, and now moving forward in a draft format, a secondary plan, the Fruit and Winona secondary plan area. So for the most part, the policies uh, that were identified through the o OMB order or decision. Uh, to some degree exempted two parcels. Uh, this included one of those parcels on the grounds that uh, most of the work, as long as most of the work had been done in terms of the studies and whatnot, that this this institutional use could move forward. Okay, um, and with regards to the institutional use, um, if we approve this and the school board and in a few years changes their position with regards to the need for this property. What would happen then to the property? How would it be zoned? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, um, in terms of the school site, it's, uh, from what uh, the planning rationale report provided by, by Mr. Webb and, this, and the Catholic School Board, they've indicated that the school is, is going to be constructed in the very near future. I think they've identified a, a date of September 2014 and that the, the province has also provided funding to develop or construct the school. Um, so that's the first answer to your question. But secondly, under the institutional I-1 zone, residential is permitted as of right. So the school will be constructed provided the province continues to say they're going to pay for it and there's no other hiccups. There's no issue for us with regards to the zoning. It's not going to be flipped into residential at a higher market value. Through, through the chair to the councillor, that's, that's not my understanding. My understanding is that there is an immediate need to construct a school given that the existing school down, down, the, down the street westerly of this location is, uh, I guess you could say, bursting at the seams. There's portables on site. They have identified the need to construct the school. And as, as far as I know, they do have the funding. But I would maybe leave it to my colleague there to, uh, to identify that further if, 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 the, if the committee would wishes to speak to him as well. Before we do that, Mr. Chairman, could I ask Mr. McCabe a question? Um, this goes back to our, our decision quite some time ago in terms of indicating that the school board is going to eliminate a school and it was a school, then it's now in essence residential. It's already pre-zoned for residential. It's been kind of gnawing at me for a while now. What prevents the school board from deciding to indicate that they're moving forward with a school and then they don't proceed and then they 
end up increasing the commercial market value and just flip it to residential. Not that a school board would ever think of raising money that way. And through you, Mr. Chair, so that's quite possible. It has happened before. We all know that. Um, in the old Hamilton bylaw, residential was permitted as a right as well. So when we did the new I-1 zoning, it, it allows low-rise single zone. townhouses and stuff. Certainly they could sell it for singles and semis without um, a rezoning process, but the plan, it would require a plan of subdivision which would come before you for approval. Yeah. Thank you. I understand. Seeing no more questions, we'll move to receive the staff presentation. That's moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? None opposed. Thank you, Joe. And uh, now we'll hear from the public. Pardon me. Right. So it's, sorry, we, it's one more. Missed it in the uh, notes. So the applicant, James Webb, is going to come forward and present. Representing the uh, school board. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm James Webb. I'm the planning consultant speaking to you today on behalf of the school board. Also in attendance, um, should any further questions arise that I may need assistance with, I have, I have uh, Vince Romelli and Roy Drysdale from the school. And to address any um, transportation or traffic issues, we have Jim Mallett from Paradigm Transportation Solutions. At the outset, I'm pleased to say that we are in full agreement and support of the recommendations before you from staff. We thank staff for their diligence in bringing this matter to this meeting today and all their hard work assisting us with the timelines. And the timelines are key. Um, this site is funded. The monies are in place at the province. It is an approved project. The school board's business case is, is predicated on the school, in fact, being open in September of 2014. Uh, construction's slated to start this fall. We've um, initiated the process of working through a site plan application with staff to deal with all those detailed aspects and the approval today with a holding provision, <coughs> excuse me, will allow us to deal with all those detailed matters regarding um, transportation, locations of crosswalks, um, the interface with the adjoining property in terms of interim stormwater management, and then the larger infrastructure requirements of installing the necessary upgrades along um, the road frontage. Um, <coughs> We are aware that uh, the Winona Peach Festival is here today and we'll be addressing the committee with some comments. Um, we undertake on behalf of the school board to say that they're um, full and ongoing dialogue with them as, as a neighbor um, to ensure that the, firstly there won't be any adverse impacts during their festival time, which I believe is in August. Um, and longer term, you know, the board and um, the board has full expectations about being a good neighbor if there's issues about making parking available. Um, all of those types of discussions can happen as we proceed. Specific to the question about parking, um, this site is proposing an oversupply of parking. My understanding, and I have my contacts in, so I can't even read the fine print of my sign plan, site plan, <laughs> but I believe that we are oversupplying the parking, the requirement based on not just the number of schools in the building, but even should portables re be required at some future date. The number of parking spaces required is 48. We're providing 69. There is no intention to design the site in such a manner that people will, by ease, park across the street and walk. Um, there's a dedicated bus drop-off at the front of the school. There's dedicated um, parent drop-off at the side of the school. This template is following two recently developed and operating schools as what the board has learned through best practices is the best way to get people off the street onto the site for face safe delivery of children. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll end my comments at that point. If there are any questions that arise, I'd be pleased to assist. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Webb, good morning. Uh, with regards to stormwater management pond, so uh, we heard earlier this morning concerns from a resident with regards to accessibility to the ponds by children. Um, here we're placing a school in close proximity. So how are we going to reconcile the two and ensure that the kids... Are yeah, 
there, through you, Mr. Chairman, there is isn't there is no on-site stormwater management pond being proposed. As, a, as an interim measure, there is an outlet in the adjoining foothills development that we will be conveying our stormwater to. Um, I don't have my civil engineer here today, but to my understanding, I do not believe that there is, in fact, a proposal for an interim pond on the school lands. Um, there is a holding provision that has been put in place. We're in agreement with that, so any issues with respect to if there isn't going to be any ponding to ensure its safety and interface with those children. So the comment is duly noted. So there's no pond anywhere around the school? Not within the school site proper. Uh, there are lands to the... Has to be a management pond to handle we are, we're all subject property. Yeah, we are connecting to an existing outlet within the foothills development that we will be conveying our water to. It's a piped system. Ultimately, with the future development of the foothills lands and the additional phases, it's our understanding that there is to be a new stormwater management facility built that will be done in accordance with all the city guidelines and requirements, including fencing. Um, with regards to parking, um, and I'm not sure whether or not Mr. Webb can answer it or not, but I hear all of the assurances about parents not doing what our concerns are, and I can tell you in my word, Oh Lord, that is not what is happening. They they just kind of take right over, and even kids that live within a couple of blocks are being driven to school. And and I can tell you quite clearly that every single school in my ward, I have ongoing issues with. We have no parking stipulated. The police don't want to go up and charge people, but the the parents are still doing it. The school board doesn't enforce it. The principal goes out, talks to them, and the next week it's back to normal. So I'm having a difficult time um, feeling comfortable with the assurances that the best practices have resolved the issue overall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, my best response to that is we have, we have oversupplied parking. We have an excess of on-site parking dedicated for staff. There's in excess of 20 additional spaces. It's designed with a dedicated drop-off area for parents, a dedicated drop-off area for the buses. And those drop-off areas in no way conflict with the on-site parking. So um, I think the issue is recognized. We've done what we can by way of the preliminary site plan that we've provided to the city to show how it can be done in a safe manner. Um, the issue can certainly be resolved or further discussed with staff when we get to the detailed approval of the site plan to see if there's any further measures. There's a crossing guard that will be stationed at the link where should anyone decide to park across the street in the park to cross from that parking lot to the school so they can certainly be duly chastised by the crossing guard for, for doing that. <laughs> um, if you want to give them the authority to issue tickets. Yeah, that hasn't really worked. They're kind of sweethearts. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Johnson. Good morning, James. Thank morning. you. Um, if you look at the map behind you right now, the parent drop-off and pick up runs through the parking lot. It is in, it's internal to the site. Right, so you're parking your car and then you have to dodge cars moving in and out because it's gonna be very busy at peak hours. Are there plans to put speed humps in the in the parking lot to slow people down to, to ensure that there is a safe passage from the car to the building? Um, we have not yet identified that as a, as a detailed consideration, but we can certainly take it under advisement. Thank you. And I, too, have the same concerns that Councillor Clark, and we've talked about this as well. Um, I have three brand new schools in, in my ward, and that uh, St. Matthews and Belmore, which are up in, in Bimbrook Village, and Winona Elementary that just opened. And all three of them have chronic parking stopovers illegal stops and as Councillor Clark says you know then you get the irate parent that phones you up and says how dare you give me a ticket I was dropping my, because there's no room to park on site there's no room to park off site so I have to let my kids teacher know that he has allergy medicine today so it's in theory looks very wonderful practically it's a it's a nightmare so having said that uh, Joe was talking about having some sort of a safe passage pedestrian walkway from the Festival Park, because there's two parks there. There's the Winona Community Park and there's Festival Park, and that's the little parking lot that Joe showed you. And that's where the people will be parking and, and automatically walking across. So what are the plans for Barton Street for that li that left-hand turn? And what are the plans for a protected uh, pedestrian walk? If you could just reiterate that for the folks at home, please. Great, Mr. Chairman. First of all, the crosswalk issue. We, we've had meetings with um, numerous divisions of the city, including 
the crosswalk division. Um, we've reviewed with them all of the circumstances of this site as it relates to the timing of additional and adjoining developments. We've decided that at the interim, the best location for the crosswalk is is essentially right here, which does align with the entrance to the park on the opposite side of the street. It's not just catching cars that park there, but there's also a paved walkway that goes through the park that we understand will in fact, anyone that walks from that side of Winona, they will channel to that outlet. So at the interim, the thought is to put the crosswalk at this location. Um, should, when the Foothills development comes forward, they have plans to bring a new public street that will be a stop controlled street, their street A. It's about 150 meters further to the west. Right. When that road becomes operational, it will likely also have a crosswalk. City staff have undertaken to do a review to decide if that creates duplication, do we still need two crosswalks that close? We've agreed to provisions by way of recommendations for site plan approval, wherein we may, at that future date, relocate this crosswalk to some location at the easterly side of the site. Okay, thank you for that. Now, can you just point to that crosswalk again, that, that walkway, the paved walkway, is right there. It's sitting in front of a four-foot ditch. So to get people to cross over that ditch, to the, the pedestrian walkway, have we got provisions in place to put a culvert, a covered culvert to allow people to walk across that ditch? I know this sounds minute, but these are the things that we, we deal with once the school opens and everybody's scrambling trying to, to make up for the, the, uh, the holes in the plan. And three minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, we're aware of that. We're aware of the ditch. Um, the condition of approval that would be appended to the site plan approval will, is going to recognize that existing ditch. It's going to require culverts. And in the event that we have to relocate at any future date, we're relocating you know, in, in all of its requirements. And that's good news. Thank you very much. Uh, the, oh, sorry. And, and just out of interest, how many classrooms are going in there? You're saying, you keep saying that we have 20 extra spaces, 20 extra spaces. How many classrooms are actually going in? Uh, How many staff? The number, including portables, I believe, is, is 30. I'll just look up. 38? Did I hear 38? 38. Then that, that includes the, the portables. Okay. So they're expecting at least 48 staff, so that's why we have 20 extra parking spaces. Is that true? Uh, we're hoping that some staff may walk as well, but... But if you can appreciate, this is the day-to-day -day stuff that we deal with all the time because parents are getting ticketed, they're getting frustrated, and, and now tempers escalate out in the community. Um, and one last thing, one of the, the letters that I read in here came from the Winona Peach Festival, and I believe we have a, a representative from the Winona Peach Festival here as well, but just to be on the, on the uh, to get your answer right away. You're saying that you want to start construction in the fall? Correct. You have a, if it was to go today, everything was fine, and you moved on, what is the start date? Um, there's no firm date in place. We have a, a project schedule where today we're hoping to achieve all of our high order planning approvals. We have a site plan application that will follow immediately. Um, six to eight weeks to achieve conditional site plan approval. We have our additional technical matters for removal of the H. We are targeting submission, submitting a building permit by August the 1st. Um, working through with staff, it's, it's ideally looking towards you know, September 1st for the initiation of construction. That gives them a year. The, the school has to be open 12 months from there. Thank you, James. And through you, just to, admit, to simplify things, one of the concerns was this would interfere with one of the biggest festivals in the city. So do we have your reassurance right now that this is not going to interfere? Even though you start ahead, ahead of the, the Peach Festival, you will be, you'll be you ensure that all the, the operations of the Peach Festival will not be interfered. Yeah, I, I can't provide you that undertaking personally, but the board is here. They're hearing your comments, and certainly we will work towards that, yes. They're shaking their heads, yes. So I'm going to take that as a, as a solemn vow, right? Thank you. I know where they live. Thank you. Thanks, James. Got myself on the list. I'll just pass the chair over. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of a school, elementary or high school or otherwise, in the city of Hamilton where it isn't afternoon and morning mayhem. And I'm assuming this school is going to be like no other. We have our uh, MLE officers. I've worked closely with my own ward with respect to the mayhem and school zones, morning and afternoon. The bell rings at the same time everywhere. And in this case, with 38 classrooms, I'm going to assume a student population of somewhere around 400, all trying to get there and get out at the same time. So I'm sure uh, municipal law enforcement will uh, you know, be able to effectively, as they have in every other school area, 
um, secure the area and uh, give tickets to guys like me who park in no stopping zones uh, when they shouldn't be. So uh, I, I'm sure uh, along with a great plan here for a brand new school, the third of which in the, in the ward, this sounds great. Fourth. Fourth. Thank you. Um, it looks like to me and from what I've read in the report, you've got that covered. So I'll just thank you, James Webb, for being here. and. Uh, one last thing. Get the chair back to, uh, I'll take the chair back from Councilor Johnson a second time. Yes, just one last thing. There's that little node up there in the top left-hand corner. What is that? That is a walkway connection that's been designed to integrate into the future phases of Foothills of Winona to allow pedestrian connectivity. Thank you. Councillor Pearson, first time. My apologies, Mr. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, James, for uh, the overview so far. And, and I don't have contacts, obviously, but I'm, there, I'm having difficulty seeing what are the two blocks on the left-hand yeah. top corner? Like are Those, they for portables? That's the indication of future location of portables. They are, they are not intended at this point in time, but responsibly the board does need to design in the potential that the uh, school exceeds its design capacity of 505 students. And how many students was this proposed now, initial build? 505 with all day kindergarten. Great, okay, thank you. Um, and obviously, I mean, the traffic issues, and I know my ward, I'm just dealing with another Catholic school as far as a bus lay by, so I'm pleased to see that there, and, and traffic issues, so obviously I'm sure tra traffic will recommend no stopping in front of the, uh, on the Barton Street um, frontage. I know I've had that at, in front of Mountain View on Barton Street. And it, it, it works on, where on Barton Street at front of Mountain View. It has worked. So, uh, and we have a crossing guard there also. Um, so my next question, though, is the way the parking lot is, and I know I appreciate you mentioned the opportunity potentially in the future for Peach Festival to have additional parking, but I'm looking at just the use of the school, and I'm looking at the other schools in my ward right now. If they had an assembly and they had all the parents there for Christmas assembly or whatever, how can they access, and at Mountain View, they park on the field. How do they access that in that location? Um, they would need to access why this is the dedicated bus drop-off. There is a series of gates here. So they can get in and get through there. Yeah, this is the, uh, I believe this is where the custodian area is. So this entrance is actually designed to allow for entry into the, the paved area there. Okay, I just wanted to be sure. And um, certainly, and again, then I'm just gonna ask also the last question Councillor Johnson raised about the requirement of filling, uh, putting a culvert in and covering over. Um, will there be a requirement in, in the construction of some type of a sidewalk along the frontage there, be it asphalt or whatever? Yes, three, Mr. Chairman. That was one of the issues that was identified at, at the very outset of the project. In addition to extending a sanitary sewer across the frontage, there is the requirement to make a connection to the existing sidewalk that ends some distance to the east. It'll be extended across the adjoining lands and then extended across the frontage of the school. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no further speakers, motion to receive the delegate moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much, James. Great presentation and great questions from committee. Now you can come on down. Third time's a charm. Members of the public wishing to address committee, please come on down to the podium. Write your name, your address, and your postal code, and your telephone number on the sheet provided prior to speaking. And I'll ask again, any members of the public wishing to address committee on this matter? We have one. Anyone else? Going once, twice, sold. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I believe that I'm mostly here to reiterate some of the points that have already been raised and to um, provide you with, as uh, Councillor Johnson often says, a resident's uh, expert opinion. 
uh, the use of this land f um, for an elementary school appears to be a good use for the land, so I'm not here to oppose that. However, I am here to reiterate a number of the questions that have already been raised by members of this committee uh, from the community's perspective. One of my first questions is, and it would have been addressed to the uh, applicant and his agent. However, I'm hoping that when I raise the questions that I will be raising, that you as a, a committee will raise them and continue to follow them through with the applicant. Uh, Councillor Clark discussed the, pot the potential for um, a different use for this piece of property down the road if something happened, and I appreciate that you did that. One of the other parts of that, or components of that question is um, what changes would be required if the applicant decided to change it to a secondary school? as opposed to an elementary school. I agree with the questions that you asked and the concern that that would raise. Um, but I'm hoping that, again, if I raise these questions, somebody will at least ask or follow through with them. And if, if that were to take place, in other words, uh, changing an elementary to a secondary, what would the process be in terms of the public process? Um, through the chair, are the questions going to be answered as I go along, or are they just going to be written down? You'll just uh, continue with your presentation. It looks like the ward councillor is taking note, and I expect, given her thoroughness, her reputation for thoroughness, that she'll follow up accordingly with staff following your presentation. Thank you. Also, uh, we've dis there's been discussion about the school in the community, uh, but I didn't hear any uh, conversation, and I don't think I saw it in the report. What uh, provisions would the Hamilton Wentworth uh, Catholic School Board make to work with the community for the use of the facility? You're all very well aware, I'm sure, with uh, Councillor Johnson's assistance, that there are no recreation facilities at this end of the city. So um, I would hope that part of this process would include some kind of an agreement or at least discussions um, to develop a plan between the city and the school board for the use of this, this facility uh, for the use of the public uh, uh, beyond the school community. I also want to reiterate and reassure, or not reassure, but ask for reassurance from the Planning Committee and the City of Hamilton with regard to the parking. Uh, Councillor Johnson did the math and it essentially means that there are 20 spots on site for the, the uh, parents. That's not very many, so whatever you can do to uh, extend the number of parking spots on site, I think that would be uh, a really good idea. I do live in Winona, as you know, and I'm aware of the parking situation at the new elementary school, so we don't want uh, to uh, make that worse. Another question that I don't think has been addressed is the number of buses picking up and uh, dropping off. Now, I did leave the room for a moment and perhaps it was addressed, but I think that's, um, it's not just on site that I'm asking that question. It's with regard to the traffic. And I think it's an important uh, component. I am very supportive of the holding provision that has been put on this property and I respectfully ask that the traffic study include a review of 50 road. I do not have a PowerPoint app, um, presentation but I do have two photos of 50 road that I'd like to circulate if I may. Hand them to the clerk please. Well, I was kind of shocked at the beginning that the process didn't go the way it's always supposed to go, and then it eventually did go, but anyway, that's fine. Um, I would like to... <laughs> My string beans, by the way, were fine, so right back at you. I'm coming to Winona to get them. 
Uh, I would like to ask that additional provisions be made to upgrade 50 Road for the safety of all concerned and without further burden to the taxpayers of Hamilton. This report already acknowledges on page 16 that students will be traveling to the school from across the Queen Elizabeth Highway, which means the buses will be using 50 Road. As you can see in the picture that's, the, the pictures that are coming around, it's still a very small road surface with ditches and there were cement um, telephone pole, or sorry, hydro poles that were put in about 2009 that are very close to that road. Uh, I really hope that this committee will uh, include in that traffic study some provision for funding uh, to improve that road. And especially uh, the second picture there shows the corner of 50 Road and Barton Street. That's a very sharp turn that even cars currently have difficulty making. So although the applicant is not the owner of that property and I recognize that uh, there wouldn't be the need at this time for improvement to that road if it weren't for this development so I think it's appropriate that there be some uh, support given by the owner and applicant to improve that part of the road and Barton Street from that would be east of the property. Also uh, as noted in the report, you're going to be, I believe you're either in the process of or um, going to uh, ask for an uh, environmental assessment of the area with regard to the whole, that end of the uh, Scooby lands. But uh, I understand that they're looking, and I'm glad to hear it, at a grade separation at the railway. So I'm hoping again that uh, the owner of this property may be encouraged to participate financially in that um, part of the uh, environmental assessment and the upgrades to the area. It's my understanding that the Catholic School Board will be paying for the costs anticipated moving easterly from Sonoma, Sonoma for sanitary and storm sewers. I strongly reinforce that the owner must contribute to the cost of the widening of Barton Street at that area as well, since the school and the foothills will be contributing factors to the need for the widening. All of this widening should not fall on the taxpayers of Hamilton. Last week, the community learned at a community meeting that there will be 700 cars per day in that area anticipated. That's for the foothills of Winona, and that's new um, tri uh, trips, uh, correct? Yes, so that's <laughs> over and above what's already there. Uh, so we do need to encourage that things are done correctly and that it doesn't all fall to the taxpayer. I know as councillors you have uh, approved a number of developments recently in Hamilton that have resulted in after the fact payments. For example, the Walmart on 20 Highway. That's become a cost to the city of Hamilton and I'm hoping that we can do something proactively. Under staging, in, on page eight, there was a statement made, there are no anticipated budgetary impacts. That's the crux of my conversation with you today. I'm hoping that you will reinforce that statement and that um, there will not be any budgetary impacts. I would also like to know how the applicant plans to work with the Winona Peach Festival. There, was, there has been some reference to that already. and listening to both uh, the counselor and the applicant, uh, sorry, the agent, um, there was a great deal of talk about using the festival field and the, the Winona Park for the school, and that's fantastic. But in your discussions, I hope you will reinforce that the opposite has to be true too. So I've already uh, spoken briefly with the agent and um, one of the members of the school board, uh, but I would like to, you to include in your paperwork some statement that would encourage uh, the Hamilton Wentworth Catholic School Board uh, the opportunity to work with the Winona Peach Festival, to develop a plan, to ensure a cooperative relationship that benefits both entities. Uh, 
since they are both there to help the community. Just for your information, uh, Winona Peach Festival, as you know, is owned and operated by 20 nonprofit community based church sports and service organizations. And one of those members is the Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish. So there's this ongoing unity already, and I'm hoping that the uh, committee and ultimately council will do what it can to foster the, a relationship that is beneficial to both. With the greatest of respect, I ask that the provisions as outlined in the report be strengthened with the suggestions made here today to ensure that additional city funds not be required to provide for the requirements of this development and for those of the foothills of Winona. Thank you very much. All right, thanks Georgina. We do have a question or two, a comment probably as well from Councillor Johnson. Thanks, Georgina, for coming in. And for those who don't know, Georgina is a former City of Stony Creek Councillor, along with uh, Councillor Maria Pearson. Um, Georgina, I, th I think we've got, I think I got it covered, and that's, and I think we already asked the question if this became a different use, that it would be low rise single homes. That's what it would revert to, unless they come in and ask for an, an application appeal. But what about the, if, if they, is there a process if it were just to change from an elementary to a secondary, because that'll increase the okay. density. And that's, oh, that's, that was my next one. Thank you. It was with the, the secondary. So I'll ask Mr. McCabe again to reiterate that. Um, you're hoping that the Catholic School Board, through you, Chair, to Georgina, hoping the Catholic School Board will work closely with the community as far as providing rec space and also to work with the Peach Festival to have that reciprocal use. You're using our parking lot, can we use yours, right? And also, um, we talked about the, the 20 extra spaces on site, but you're concerned that that's still not enough, that maybe we could try to tweak some more in. The amount of buses, I think this comes down to traffic. And I don't think I, re I heard in your applicant or in your uh, speaking that, as I said earlier, looking at one application, it looks wonderful, but when you look holistically at the entire area, then you have to have a lot of factors in place. So we've got Walmart, Costco, uh, LCBO, three uh, financial st um, institutions coming, various restaurants are coming into one property alone, and it's along 50 Road. So we also had a transport truck driving school that used to have lots of fun going around those corners, and they'd always ditch out. It was almost we would set up our, our uh, lawn chairs and watch that happen. It was a, very entertaining. So your your question is, is there what are the plans for upgrading on, on 50 Road, but also the, the grade separation at the... So I think I've got everything all covered for that. So I just want to, when you're finished, I'll, ask, I'll be asking staff all that up for the people at home. The only issue, the only other issue I'm not sure that I emphasized enough is um, in the report, the applicant has agreed to work with the Peach Festival not to impede the festival when it's there, and you already addressed that, but I want to reiterate that it's more than impede. I want them, uh, it was nice wording in the report, but I'm hoping for stronger wording to uh, make sure that it's an amicable weekend for all those concerned. And I think the wording through you, Chair, will be that the area councillor will work with the applicant on that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Georgina. Councillor Whitehead. Um, you've talked about improvements that aren't directly related to the, um, this particular development. Um, uh, so I just asked the question, and it's, uh, it's clear to me that the school board is exempted from DCs. DCs are development charges are meant to uh, make the improvements, growth-related improvements that you identified. But apparently uh, the school's going there to meet that, uh, the, the growth that's taking place in that area. That's part a result of the growth. But all the development around there still plays DCs. So a lot of the things you identified are clearly need attention. Uh, you know, even with this development, I just want to know uh, if you're aware that, uh, that and Brenda's really good at this, we're, uh, making sure that we utilize those DCs to address uh, 50 Road and some of those expansions. So I don't know if we can tie that. I, a matter of fact, I know we can't tie it to this development, but we can certainly uh, work with the ward councillor uh, to ensure that the DCs are made available to make the, uh, the changes that you've identified. Do what you can so that there isn't an inquest. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Georgina. Move to receive the presentation of the delegation moved by Councilor Pearson, seconded by Councilor Proctor. Draw in favor. That's carried. I made this one. Uh, anyone else wishing to address committee on this item? Going once, 
twice. All right, and Councillor Johnson, you wanted to ask some questions, follow up, no Thank problem, you. to staff. And through you to Tim, I know you've mentioned this before, that if this is zoned institutional, and for whatever reason, a hurricane comes through the offices and, and we can't get the funding, and this school no longer can be, although we've zoned it now institution, what does it then become, or what can it become by default? So through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the lands are zoned neighborhood institutional, so we have three categories, three levels of hierarchy of institutional. And the neighborhood institutional, the I-1, only allows singles and semis and and uh, um, neighbor, neighborhood type institutional, so a place of worship and an elementary school. And um, in anticipation of your next question, if they wanted to change it to a secondary school, it would need a rezoning, because the I-1 does only allows an elementary school. So just to be clear, if they wanted to change it to secondary, they'd have to need a rezoning. Would there also be a lot of, a lot of different specs that would be needed? They need more space, do they not, and, and more? Well, tip, yeah, typically the size of a secondary school is uh, considerably more than, than uh, an elementary school size. They would have to do other studies and traffic studies and that kind of stuff. Okay, so just to, for through you, Chair, just to be practical, to go to a secondary school zoning probably would not happen given the size of the property, correct? Yeah, so 2.3 hectares wouldn't 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 allow a secondary. School. Okay, and thank you for that. Um, and also uh, through you to Tim, one of the questions was to see if we could squeeze more parking on site. Looking at the plan and knowing the um, report that came forward, do you see that as a possibility? Well, I think uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we could look at it at the site plan stage. So I'm not sure exactly what the school board intends with the whole property, but there is. A, there is potential for it, but we could look at that at the site plan stage. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, just through you to Tony Sergi, um, because this becomes a, a, an economic growth situation, given that we've got Walmart, we've got Costco, we've got all the things that I just mentioned, we're going to have another 278 homes coming into this area, plus we now have an active school that's coming in. What are the plans for 50 Road as far as upgrading, either widening and uh, grade separation at the at the uh, train tracks. I'm always trying to be proactive rather than be reactive, and I'm worried that once all this gets in, we're now gonna be scrambling trying to figure out how to make the road system better. So do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, through the chair, uh, 50 road, there's nothing in the capital budget right now for upgrades to 50 road, though there is a, an approved environmental assessment uh, indicated that it will be reconstructed as a two-lane roadway. Uh, the question whether there will be a, a grade separation at CN Rail came about uh, during the, um, the application and planning process for the commercial development on the north side of the tracks, the, the Panady development. Um, looking at future traffic in the area, it was there was a, a warrant met for possible grade separation at the CN Rail line based on full build out of the area. Um, we've got that information, decisions on whether that will occur haven't been made at this point. Uh, Public Works is currently looking at the merits of whether to move that forward as, as a need. Uh, but currently it's, 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 at that, it's, it's the status is that it doesn't really have any status other than it's been flagged as a potential need. Um, and again, it's just based on traffic warrants that in a future build out that it could trigger the, the warrant for, for a, a, a great separation there. Thanks for that, Gavin. And Gavin, when does it? When do we finally realize that we've invited all this activity, including the truck stop across from the Panati development? And given that that half of 50 Road is actually in the green belt, what? When do we finally pull the trigger and say enough is enough? We're going to be doing this, whether we like it or not. Uh, through the chair, I think just based on the fact that we've sat down over the last year to discuss the merits of that project and how it would be implemented and the kind of work that needs to be done to understand how it could get constructed, because it's not cheap. Great separations like that are in the several millions of dollars. So again, just recently in the not last six months, we sat down with Public Works and that because they flagged the, the, the they flagged the need initially through the review of the traffic impact study, and we've we've asked them to review the merits a little deeper and then move it forward if it if it's going to be a requirement so that we could then include it in the capital budget moving forward. 
Thank you, Gavin. And one last thing for Gavin. The access to 50 actually is a mountain access, and it looks pretty sad shape right now. So given the fact that when when Panati and all the rest of them came in and said, we're going to be um, drawing crowds from Smithville, Upper Stony Creek, that we're going to be using this access more often. So does the ESA start from one end of 50 to the other, or is it just limited between Barton and, and the service road? the chair you're asking about the limits of the ESA along 50 road right are we just being parochial and looking at one little area or are we looking at the entire road from the start of the, the top of the mountain down to the lake um, in terms of the the master plan the transportation master plan for the upgrading of roads I, I don't believe it would have looked at uh, the escarpment crossing itself not in the context of future plan growth there because a lot of what we knew about Panady and the, and the change to commercial zoning came after the, uh, the process started for the transportation master plan. In any case, I think it's a fair question to what degree does new development affect 50 roads south of Highway 8? And I'd have to look at the, uh, the transportation master plan to see how it, it, uh, how it looked at the, the, the larger context of growth uh, or traffic from outside the region coming in. But then again, the traffic impact study would also look at that, again, to what degree it's very accurate because it will be a little more high level the minute you get farther away from where the actual growth is occurring. Thank you, Gavin. And I think I'm just going to put that out there. We need to be a little bit more broaden our horizon as far as that's concerned. One of the things that Mr. Rossini always told me was the reason it costs so much money for Hamilton to take care of their roads is because we have two um, 400 series highways and mountain accesses. And we all know what's happened in the past, just the last two winters, what's happened to two of the, the mountain accesses. And we're repairing huge repairs going into, I believe, my, my counselor friend over here, his uh, ward because they're they're very fragile if you if but if we're going to invite all this traffic coming into the area we need to look at the whole area and not look at just one little section of the road and say here's where we need to widen it but the rest of it can all go to pound salt so having said that thank you very much uh, Gavin I appreciate that um, okay so if you can come back to me I'd like to put in a provision that the ward council will work with the Catholic School Board and the Peach Festival and we'll also work with the our rec center and the Catholic School Board to see if we can utilize some space there Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, not sure who on staff would like to address this, but I'd like to know if there have been conversations uh, with the rail line. I think it's CN that owns the, the rail line there. So we had conversations with them regarding grade separation or the safety contingencies given the additional traffic that's going to be flowing across it. I think we haven't. Sorry, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't want to, through the chairman, I know, traffic staff aren't here, but it's my understanding that they had discussions with CN Railway in terms of reviewing the traffic study that's been submitted by Panady for their commercial development, for ascertaining whether or not certain traffic warrants or other factors are being met or what those threshold levels are um, as it relates to the Panady study and the submission of their traffic study. Um, so there have been some preliminary discussions between our traffic staff and CN about the future growth in the area and as it relates to the uh, grade separation. I haven't been personally involved in any of those discussions, so I can't comment on what was sort of the outcome of it other than they were just having some of those preliminary discussions and getting some background information. Um, so I think, Mr. Chairman, we may want to solidify that with a motion to ensure that those conversations are occurring and that there is a reasonable um, an equitable sharing of the costs for the grade separation. The grade separation is to CN's advantage, not to the City of Hamilton's advantage. Um, but if we don't push that envelope, they're not going to willingly open the door to have the discussion. So um, I would suggest that the <laughs> ward councillor would draft a motion to that effect to make sure that we are having those discussions. Can I ask what the safety provisions are currently on the rail crossing? Is it just signals or is it um, the barriers come down? I don't go down there except for um, Peach Festival and I'm seeing cheerleading in the crowd so I think it's a barrier go down. Um, so we want to make sure that that um, you have to have the discussion with them in advance of the school going in in advance of the development. Okay. Is that a question or? Um... 
I'm looking for clarification. Clarification. Mr. Uh, Mr. Robichaud? It's, sorry, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that it's an unprotected crossing. So you you slow down, you stop, but it doesn't have the full gates on it like you would see at some other okay. crossing intersection. So if that's the case, then uh, again, we need to move the request from the city to CN to have um, the stop bars come down and, and the lights and to, to ensure that um, the safety of the residents and, and that community is protected. With regards to Barton Street and 50 Road, it, um, I thought I heard staff indicate that it's not on the capital plan. Can I get verification as to that? That kind of surprised me given all the work that we did with Padati and uh, Walmart and Yahoo Truck Stop or whatever that truck stop is out there. Through the chair, the question was asked of uh, Public Works a couple of weeks ago in terms of just ensuring that we understood the timing of 50 road urbanization because we understand it'll be a need. It, currently, right now, it's not on the program, but it'll be. We've already included in the discussions for 2014 about how we uh, plan for that upgrade uh, within the short term and the medium term. Can I ask whether or not the environmental assessment has been completed on the upgrades to 50 road? Uh, you would need an EA to do the work. The EA was completed in, I think, 08 for the all of Scooby. It identified the basic upgrades required for uh, Barton Street and 50 Road. And uh, the level of the class environmental assessment that was completed was Schedule B. Certain projects trigger another look, a Schedule C, Class EA. Barton Street is one of those based on the, the cost of the scope of the work. Uh, 50 Road, I'm not so sure, but the reality is if we're getting into discussions about uh, grade separations, well, there's a good chance it'll, it will trigger a Schedule C class environmental assessment regardless. We wouldn't just go out there and think we can um, do a project like that without additional study. Okay, but I'm, I'm a little bit concerned, Mr. Chairman, um, and again, I'm not the ward councillor, um, but understanding the traffic volumes that were within that traffic study from Panati, and, and I w did work with the councillor closely on the to delay any implementation to improve Barton Street or 50 Road under the auspices of we're trying to get a decision on the grade separation um, means that you're going to put a lot of people at risk in terms of potential collisions in that area with, with the development that's occurring. So I need to have, I would suggest, we need to have better clarification in terms of what exactly can be done prior to the grade separation. The grade separation EA could take you five years. You can't sit there with a two-lane road on Barton and a two-lane road on 50 with all that development without having some plan in place in terms of improving the traffic flow. I understand we don't want to duplicate costs. I get all that. But safety is also the, the major component of our concern. So um, I'd suggest again that the ward councillor should direct a motion to staff to, to get a report back to us with regards to how this is going to be done um, in light of the fact that the grade separation may take a lot. We, we're arguing grade separation with CN and other areas that we still don't have. So it, it's a bit of a challenge. So I'll leave that to the ward councillor. Um, but I, I, I would think that the development charges that we took in for all of those projects down there would help pay for the growth in terms of the expansion of those roads. So I wouldn't want to delay it. Thank you. Great observations. Thank you, Councillor. No other question. I'm going to put myself on the list and pass the chair over. Just a quick uh, question to uh, whomever on staff may be able to help. Could be the wrong committee. And uh, maybe, Councillor Clark, with your experience in uh, the uh, provincial uh, side of things, you could uh, offer something up here. But Georgina brought up a very good point, one that uh, um, was a gr of great interest to me, and then it made me sort of think of um, Dr. Davies School and what's happening here in the inner city and partnerships with the school board and how sometimes they can get tricky. And quite obviously, we're reading today about a very big one uh, with the city of Hamilton and uh, with respect to the Pan Am site. So it's my understanding, and, and I'll, I'll preface as well by saying 
As uh, the Farr family is concerned, it has been an absolutely brilliant experience dealing with the Hamilton uh, Catholic School Board on after school and weekend activities in their facilities, particularly with the Blessed Sacrament basketball. But in my history, there's been plenty going on outside of school hours and the doors are, are often open. But is it not provincially mandated or provincially legislated that with these partnerships um, occur, particularly when we're talking about a new school through you, uh, Chair, to whomever on staff can offer that who would like to take that one Anybody? one of well, the answer oh sorry mr. Uh, Councillor Clark uh, was saying that there's no requirement it's yeah, so there's no legislative requirement or no requirement of the school boards it's based on our partnership agreements that we work with the school boards out of recreation I believe uh, There is no legislation. Thank you. I'll okay. take the chair back. Councillor Whitehead. You know, actually looked into that a couple of years ago. There was an initiative by the provincial government to encourage schools to provide more public access. Uh, it's not regulatory. It was more of a guideline or an encouragement to uh, the schools. And I've utilized the actual verbiage in negotiating uh, arrangements with schools in my ward. So it is a, a, a sort of a principle but it's not a regulated or legislated uh, principle. The uh, other component I, I, I might suggest is we do have, again, the school board liaison committee with the city. So whenever you're dealing uh, with the, uh, uh, the school board on these kinds of issues, uh, it's good to have some of that uh, discussion and dialogue at that committee so that uh, we can resolve uh, and ensure that we're meeting the needs of the community at the same time, or the school board's meeting the needs of the school board. So I would only suggest that uh, uh, that request or that, that discussion would also be forwarded to that particular committee for further uh, resolution. Great, great suggestion. Um, and I'm not certain if the board councillor um, is addressing it in the motion or not, but I am certain that uh, uh, in due course, and in short order, um, that kind of uh, community partnership with the school, be it with the Wine on a Peach Festival folks and the over 20 volunteer organizations that work with Councillor Johnson as one of the volunteers to put that together. And uh, the kids and the families in the nearby community will be accessing and uh, utilizing the facilities in a brand new school with a brand new gym and different uh, things like libraries. Um, and that's the good work that uh, Councillor Johnson will be doing going forward. If it's not already in the motion, but we're at the point now, let's see if it is. We'll go to the motion now on this item and uh, to you the board councillor councillor johnson uh, moved by myself seconded by councillor clark that the recommendations be amended by adding subsections c and d as follows the ward councillor will meet with the winona peach festival and the catholic school board to discuss reciprocal uses of parking lots and d the possibilities of using rec space for rec programming oh. okay so that's for this and i would if you will please come after we finish approving this that we come back for me i've got a couple more motions going forward thank you that's moved by yourself, seconded by Councillor Clark. On the motion, on the amendments, I guess, to the recommendations, Councillor Whitehead? Well, I just, on uh, an amendment, I would suggest that, and a, and a copy of that position be forwarded to the school board liaison committee. It's a friendly amendment. Okay, and that a copy be forwarded to the school board. Uh, and I'll pass the chair, just one quick question to staff, Councillor Johnson, to be thorough here. Uh, through you as chair to Tim. Any issues with what we have before us as these amendments? No issues, uh, Mr. Thank you. I'll take the chair back and we will vote now on those amendments. Uh, moved by Johnson, seconded by Clark. All in favor? Chair. Any opposed? Seeing none. Councillor Johnson, did you want the floor back? Just to uh, approve the application as amended. Okay, first we need to close the uh, public meeting officially. Moved by Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? No opposed. And now a motion to approve the staff recommendations as amended. Moved by Councillor Johnson and seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Any opposed? On uh, a new item. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, yeah. I have two additional motions to put forward that are that are sort of part of this application, but not really, so that's why we want to keep them separate. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Clark, that staff have formal discussions with CN regarding any and all improvements, including a grade separation at the 50 Road Crossing. And that's the first motion. So do we just do these separately? 
And the second one was that staff report back on the timeline for improvements on 50 Road, including this intersection at Barton to accommodate the development. Two part motion. Moved by Councilor Johnson, seconded by Councilor Clark. All okay. in favor? Any Here. opposed? And that moves. Thank you. Okay, thank you. On to 6-3. This is the application for amendments to the City of Hamilton zoning bylaw number 6593 draft plan of subdivision and draft plan. This is out uh, Ward 8 way, Councillor Whitehead. Members of the public in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act, please be advised that if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the City of Hamilton before Council approves the zoning bylaw amendments and the draft plan of subdivision and condominium, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Council of the City of Hamilton to the Ontario Municipal Board and the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Municipal Board unless, in the opinion of the board, there are reasonable grounds to do so. So I understand that we have uh, some speakers for this item, or a speaker anyway. I uh, will start with suggesting that uh, the staff presentation, uh, I think we, we can get Chris Bell up here now to do that. And I have to, uh, Councillor uh, Johnson, if I could ask you to take the chair for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the Planning Committee. Um, this application uh, is for a zoning bylaw amendment, plan of subdivision, and plan of condominium application affecting lands at uh, 1155 West 5th Street. Uh, so you can see by the location map, the, um, uh, the purpose of this application is to amend the zoning bylaw and for uh, approval of a draft plan of subdivision and condominium. The subject lands consist of approximately 3.75 hectares on which the owners are proposing a development that will consist of 121 townhouse lots associated with a com common element condominium that will include private lanes, private visitor parking, and at least 42 excuse me, visitor parking spaces for at least 42 cars and a 450 square meter amenity area, as well as temporary stormwater management blocks that may be used in the future for up to 18 townhomes fronting onto a public road. The lands are a large vacant parcel in the Mewburn neighborhood, predominantly uh, undeveloped except for the swath of commercial lands along Upper James. This is a uh, typical view of the property uh, as viewed from um, West 5th Street. The lands to the east predominantly consist of the rear of the large commercial blocks fronting onto Upper James Street. So you'll see uh, the bottom slide is a picture of the property itself and um, on the other side of the fence that's the rear of the commercial properties fronting on Upper James. The lands to the north uh, consist of um, larger land parcels that are currently vacant earmarked for future urban development, one of which is currently subject to a separate zoning application, and uh, a surplus school board site, um, which I understand um, is, is considering being sold off by the school board. Lands to the south um, include two existing single detached dwellings fronting onto West 5th Street and the parking area for the large commercial lots fronting onto Upper James Street and Brimo Road West. These are lands to the west. They consist of um, existing single attached dwellings and a church. Excuse me, and the lands to the south we've already got. The owner is proposing a development which will include, as I stated earlier, 121 street townhouses lots tied to a common element condominium that will consist of an internal private roadway and parking area and amenity area. Um, in short, it's the, the lands on the south side of the public road. It will also include a public road that will um, eventually access uh, future lands to the north. And it includes three additional blocks which are temporary stormwater management 
facilities, which once future uh, neighborhood-wide uh, stormwater management facilities are, are um, constructed, will be able to be used for future residential development. In terms of uh, zoning, uh, the categories for the lands within this development, the regulations have been broken up into two um, categories that essentially uh, reflect the two forms of development that are proposed uh, on the property, the two forms of uh, ownership of the townhouse units. The lands on the north side, although used temporarily for storm this portion right here, although used temporarily for stormwater management purposes, are going to be zoned um, to include regulations to permit street townhouses fronting on a public road. And the, the rest of the land predominantly will be um, zoned block two and include regulations related to the fact that they'll be tied to a vacant land condominium. Um, the lands will share similar zoning regulations um, requiring six meter wide um, lots it's consistent with the, the width of the, the townhouse units that are to be located on them, as well as site-specific special provisions that include front yards of 4.5 meters to the building and 5.8 meters to the garage, rear yards of 6.5 meters, and side yards of 1.5 meters for interior units that face each other, and three meters for end units. In addition, uh, to reflect those setbacks and the size of the unit that are located on them, the minimum lot area will be 150 square meters for each unit. In addition, the lots that are part of the Common Element um, Condominium Corporation, um, they have additional regulations to reflect the fact that they're going to be fronting on a private lane. Um, so. There is specifically a regulation in the bylaw acknowledging that it's not frontage on a public street, it is rather a public lane. But there's also additional requirements to ensure that certain facilities get built within that common element area. And that includes requiring the 450 square meter common element um, amenity area and the 42 parking spaces. There's also an additional special provision that acknowledges that the, the yards on the lots that are located on the corners in this area right here within the um, common element um, may en encroach somewhat closer to the to the private lane in order to accommodate 13 meter turning radiuses which will allow larger vehicles like um, um, garbage garbage collection to be able to go through the site. Um, in terms of the policy environment, planning staff are satisfied that the proposed subdivision and implementing zoning bylaw regulations are supportable as the proposal will comply with official plan policy, which designates the property residential and encourages a range of dwelling types and tenures, including townhouses proposed. Staff feel the proposed residential uses are located in a manner and at a density that's compatible with uh, surrounding land uses and future development. And in terms of layout of the subdivision, staff are satisfied that the road layout provides a road network that's well connected to both West 5th and will allow for the extension of the road to accommodate future anticipated development further to the north. In terms of the Mewburn neighborhood plan, um, the residential portions of the Mewburn, Mewburn neighborhood plan are predominantly um, vacant right now. Um, Portions of the subject lands adjacent to Upper James Street Corridor that affect this property have been designated for attached housing, which have contemplated um, townhouse type development on the property. Um, however, the remaining portions of land are still designated in the neighborhood plan as single and double, which will require an amendment to the neighborhood plan as part of this application. Staff note that the lands within this neighborhood, as I suggested, um, are predominantly undeveloped. And as such, it does offer an opportunity for um, to fulfill growth plan objectives of allowing alternative forms of grade oriented residential units um, with, with uh, somewhat higher densities in a newly forming neighborhood in a manner that won't compromise existing development or um, proposed uh, development in the surrounding area. In addition, staff are also satisfied that the layout of the subdivision ensures that the critical elements of the road pattern within the neighborhood plan will still allow for orderly and efficient use of the remaining residential lands within the neighborhood. Other noteworthy uh, items that have been uh, considered while we are assessing the merits of this application um, include uh, the dedication of road widenings and intersection improvements where the property will access West 5th. Um, these road improvements will require that West 5th be urbanized and include a two-way left turning lane. Um, 
there will be free, a future noise study that's required as a condition of draft plan approval. The owners have demonstrated up front that it's reasonable to achieve uh, the Ministry of the Environment's requirements for noise levels, but when we do get down to a more site-specific stage with the location of buildings, we'll be uh, requiring uh, some additional information uh, from a noise study. Uh, there will be a tree management plan in order to inventory and identify protection and relocation opportunities. Um, there are site-specific neighborhood-wide stormwater management issues um, that affect this property and the Mewburn neighborhood plan. Uh, as I suggested earlier, the proponents have demonstrated that a temporary stormwater management facilities can be located on the northern portions of their property, uh, which will accommodate their stormwater management needs at this point in time. Um, until a neighborhood-wide stormwater management pond solution can be reached, um, a number of conditions have been included in this, and the conditions of draft plan approval uh, have, been, have been included to ensure that these provisions are, are, that the responsibility for constructing these temporary facilities and removing them once they're no longer needed are taken care of. Um, secondly, Street A, it'll, um, the public road will be a, a phased approach to putting in that road. As part of this application currently, um, Street A will be a dead end, but a portion of, of the, the, um, the lands will be dedicated to the city right now, not as a public road, um, with the understanding that as it stands right now, um, all that's needed is that small portion of road, but it does ensure that as future development happens, once stormwater uh, management issues through the neighborhood have been addressed, that that road can get punched through and um, orderly and efficiently provide for access to the remainder of the lands to the north. And in the meantime, Street A will be a dead end, so there will be a temporary turning circle, as you can see on uh, our proposed um, red line um, draft plan of subdivision. Um, the extent of the lands um, required for the turning circle have been identified in a draft plan and uh, have been included in uh, conditions 13 and 16 of the conditions of draft plan approval. As noted in the staff report, the application was pre-circulated in accordance with the city's public partition pace public participation policy in March 2nd, 2012 to 51, noti uh, 51 residents. Um, as a result of those concerns and subsequent concerns, uh, a, a few um, letters have come in. One has made its way into this report and there are two other additional letters that are in your package available today. Um, in planning staff's opinion, these seem to focus pre predominantly on the orderly, efficient use of the surrounding lands within the Mewburn neighborhood um, from a traffic access and stormwater management perspective. Um, as already indicated uh, earlier in my presentation, I think these, these issues have been addressed in the staff report, which in short concludes that staff are satisfied that the orderly and efficient development may still occur by including a public road accessing the lands to the north by requiring the urbanization, excuse me, the urbanization of West Fifth, and by the installation of temporary stormwater management blocks until a permanent neighborhood-wide solution can be implemented. However, staff are prepared to provide uh, any additional clarification to the committee if necessary. Well, one other note is um, um, Parkview Church had also indicated some concerns about um, parking and, and traffic. Uh, from a parking perspective, I can tell you that um, the, this, this proposal is with the 42 parking spaces that are proposed on the site itself. It does meet the um, zoning bylaw requirement for visitor parking spaces at 0.3 parking spaces per unit. And in terms of um, additional traffic onto West Fifth, um, a couple notes to make on that. Number one, this is an area that is going to be urbanized, both in terms of new development uh, on these lands, which is going to generate additional traffic flows, as well as uh, improvements to uh, West, West Fifth Street to an urbanized standard and with uh, intersection improvements, um, which, which um, should address traffic issues as growth occurs. So in light of the foregoing, staff is recommending approval of these applications on the basis that they are consistent with the provincial policy statement and places to grow legislation. They are consistent with the Hamilton Wentworth official plan. They conform with the general intent and uh, designations of the city and Hamilton official plan. And it is considered compatible and complementary logical extension of existing development. Um, just one final note, the approval of these applications are also subject to a number of special draft plan and subdivision conditions uh, dealing with phasing, engineering, and infrastructure requirements. 
requirements. All these conditions are included in attachment E of the staff report or within the city standard form subdivision agreement. These conditions have all been addressed accordingly within the staff report. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, Chris. Just before we continue, can I have a motion to approve the correspondence that Chris was referring to, please, just to tidy up here. So we've got Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Pearson, all those in favor? Carried. And do I have any questions for Chris? I have Councillor Whitehead, anyone else? To put on the list. Okay, thank you. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Uh, can I get you to pull up the first, the, the actual uh, first picture that you showed on the slide? That one? Uh, no, the actual topographical picture, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have a pointer here, but can you point out where Wilm Connell Park is being uh, developed? My understanding it's in this area. And is there a pond in that location? I'd have to um, pass that to our development engineering staff. Good yeah, chair. On the west side of West 5th, just north of the site, there's an existing pond. Yeah, can you speak right into the sure, microphone, If you give me the please. pointer. Sure. There's, there's an existing pond. Uh, maybe I can just facilitate this. I don't know if this that. Where's this the pointer? The red button? The little button. Okay. Okay, so just in this area here, this is Willem Cullen Park. And uh, it's going to be developed. There's a storm management pond here. Uh, can I ask, uh, there was an environmental assessment uh, conducted. When was that conducted in regards to the storm management for this whole area? The servicing on both sides. When was that EA commenced? Through the chair, the Sheldon Muburn uh, Master Servicing Study, I think it was called, that looked at sanitary and stormwater, was originally, it was started uh, in 2004, might be approved around 2004 and five, so it's about that old. It, in 2009, we, uh, we undertook an update of the study to look at other issues with how stormwater was being dealt with. So we completed the update in, I think, 2010, 11. Thank you. Uh, the, the, point, the reason I'm raising that, I'm highlighting that for my, my colleagues, this has been a long uh, a process before any development could occur to try and determine uh, what the storm management needs are in, are in the area. So as a result, the EA, uh, I believe, well now it's three ponds in the whole area, but uh, two specifically were identified through the EA, one in the Wilmcolm Park and one somewhere in, in this Mubin Burn uh, uh, neighborhood, is that correct? Through staff. Through the chair, yes. Now, uh, what is not resolved is the size and, and location of that second pond. Is that correct through the chair? Through the chair, the general location of the future ultimate pond on the east side of West 5th is known. The general location and the size, the general size is known as well. Okay. Um, the reason why um, we're dealing with a temporary pond in this particular location is why? Through the chair. Through the chair, the, uh, the city has not, or the developer has not been able to acquire the lands for the future pond as yet. There's, there's still, the, the, the location where it's been identified in the study is still in private ownership. Okay, so uh, am I correct then to suggest that the, uh, we don't have an agreement with the landowners of the location where uh, the preferred site for the pond is? Correct. Okay, I just want to make that clear because we have some letters to address uh, in, in this package. Um, and how long have we been looking at that pond on this particular uh, aside? Because you said the EA, we, 2003, 2004, we, we identified two ponds, but you revisited that plan because there were concerns by the private homeowner or the private landowner uh, that that pond wasn't necessary. So you went through a, a whole new modeling exercise, is that correct, through the chair? Through the chair, the, uh, historically when the original study was approved, there was two ponds, one on the west side where the existing pond is and then this new pond on the east side. Uh, through some uh, preliminary uh, discussions with uh, developers in the area, uh, it was proposed that perhaps the pond on the east side of the road wasn't required and that it could be handled with um, a larger more extensive pond on the west side in Connell Park. Uh, we took that uh, and, and, and a little further and did more investigation, including an update to look at an additional catchment. And we completed that, and as I mentioned before, we completed that update in, in 2010 and 11, which confirmed the requirement for two ponds, uh, one on the west side and one on the east side. Thank you. So uh, I want to highlight that because I believe that uh, the, the length of time just to um, 
I guess, a, uh, prove the need for the pond on the east side was pretty extensive. It basically started in 2004 and concluded when? Uh, through the chair, the, the additional analysis report was triggered in about 2009-10. It was, the, and there were the sort of the analysis undertaken to really get to the nuts and bolts of how everything works, because uh, we were looking at uh, the fact in this area there's no overland flow routes, we have quantity control issues across the mountain, and, and how do we best deal with the issues here? So there's extensive modeling undertaken to look at flooding in the area as well. So it, in terms of the length of time, it was it was due to the effort required just to make sure we knew what we were saying in terms of uh, where and how big. I appreciate that. But it was at the request of the developers uh, because there was concern of having two ponds. That's why we did the further assessment. Is that not correct through the chair? Through the chair, that's basically correct. It, again, the initially the initial request from the development community was to eliminate the pond, and this is where we said we'd go back and look at it. We needed to update the plan anyway based on the, the length of time the EA was already approved. So again, the work was undertaken that really is triggered on a request from a developer. Thank you. Um, now, in, in on this West Fifth, this is a rural cross-section road, and there's a, a, a fair to significant dip. You don't, uh, I don't know if staff can identify where that dip is relative to this development. Where there's co constant flooding issues. Through the chair, I think there's a, a hill on the, south, uh, on the south end of this particular site. Um, the, the low point is where uh, the existing pond on the west side of the road drains across West 5th to an existing drainage outlet that goes to the, toward the east ward, Upper James. And the only reason I'm highlighting that, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, is that uh, the major concerns I get from people that currently live along West 5th is whatever development goes in, they need the road to be proved on so that they don't get the continued flooding in, uh, on uh, West 5th. And I just want to highlight that issue. Um, I guess the other uh, question I have is the, um, you indicated that within this, uh, this, this plan, uh, we've widened uh, the the, uh, the condominium streets to accommodate uh, garbage trucks with uh, the radiuses. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the the private condominium roads have been um, shown as having 13 meter wide turning radius, which would accommodate a larger vehicle. Now, in, until the uh, public road, which would be eventually a public road, uh, is actually, um, um, I guess, put into city hands. Who would be uh, maintaining uh, the snow removal on that public road, the, de the dead end road we're talking about? So you can go to the plan. The, uh, the, the plan. That one, yeah. Nope. yeah. Uh, through the chair. Um, when the plan's registered, the uh, the road itself, Street A, would become a city asset. Whether it's been fully assumed or not, it's when it, when the plan is registered as a city road. And the, the way we operate too, in terms of the uh, the legal issues associated with uh, roads that are built and are used by the public, is that a road is a road, and and we treat it that way. So when it comes to things like snow clearing, the the, the developer often does look after snow clearing when the, the roads are very difficult to get in, like when they're doing a lot of house building and, and there's still a lot of servicing going on. But the fact is, once this road is operational and the city is able to plow it, the city will do so. Now, can I ask, uh, if the developer is prepared to, uh, uh, to um, assume this road, or, or not assume it, but hold on to this public road until, because right now, uh, with this development, it's only servicing uh, this condo um, development, is that correct? Uh, sorry, I just missed the last end of your question there. Currently, this road pattern uh, without it breaking through to a new development is only servicing the this particular condo development. Correct. So there's no need for anyone to come in this road other than people living in this condo development. Yeah, that, sure, yeah, that could be the case. Okay. Uh, if the uh, developer is prepared to uh, uh, take care of the road in regards to the snow removal requirement, until the road is actually uh, uh, continues into the next development, 
uh, would that alleviate the need for uh, a, round, a roundabout or a hammerhead or whatever is required in the regulations? Uh, in terms of a public road and if there's a, an interest in the road remaining private or at least a public road where someone else look maintain it, we'd have to consult with legal about that. Okay, I think what I'm getting in terms of reducing, I think what you were also asking was, is, is can you reduce the standard of the roadway in the interim? And I think what you're getting at is the size of the bulb at the end, which we have a standard uh, 13 meter radius at the end of a, a, a temporary bulb. And we'd, we'd suggest that, again, um, We'd recommend that, notwithstanding that you do snow plowing on roads like that, you also have other city vehicles like garbage trucks mm -hmm. and uh, emergency vehicles that still need to gain access. And again, in a lot of ways, a public road is a public road. Um, you, and uh, and again, in terms of how something gets maintained by the by somebody else would be a diff it would be a question we'd speak to legal about. Again, when the plan gets registered as a public highway, one of the issues is um, the 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 if, if it. It would need to be registered as a public highway, as I understand it, because the residents that live there need to have a public highway addressed, and that would be an issue if it remained as a private roadway. Yeah, uh, I, I think what I'm looking for, and we've done this in the past, where uh, we, we've identified that we've accommodated through the widening of the condo roads, the availability for uh, city uh, garbage trucks uh, to easily go through. We've identified that the snow removal on the condo roads will be the responsibility of the, 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 the condo. We've identified that we have a road that basically is going to go nowhere other than to service this, uh, this direct community until further development or breakthrough uh, uh, on the other side takes place. So it's only servicing the condo. So the question is what is the need and requirement for the bulb at this point in time one, in fact, you can easily access our city vehicles through these condo roads, one. Two, the developer can easily maintain the, the uh, public road on an interim uh, until there's a need to uh, transfer and have the city assume it. So can I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the, uh, the rationale. It seems to me it's sort of a wasted uh, uh, need when it's really not a need when this is not one of those uh, uh, streets that uh, the garbage trucks won't have opportunity to just drive through and come back around. Through the chair, if I can uh, voice a couple of concerns. What we're trying to do is just impl implement the council approved engineering guidelines. Once you have an exceedances of 45 meters, then we ask for a temporary turnaround, uh, as Gavin indicated, for various vehicles, including the traveling public that may go down there to uh, circumvent people cutting through the uh, condo. But th those are our guidelines. After 45 meters, we ask for a temporary turnaround. Okay, so I, I will be at, at um, the, the appropriate point asking to be exempted because uh, we can easily put a, a local traffic only uh, sign and as we already identified that for street uh, vehicles, uh, it, they still can easily uh, uh, move through the, the condo area without the need uh, for the, uh, the round. Uh, I have other locations um, in my ward where we dead into the streets. I, I can think of one off of uh, Pantano. Uh, that we made that accommodation, no big circles, no big uh, turnarounds. Um, this one makes only sense because it's not one of those ones where vehicles are going to get trapped in and people have to reverse. There's no need to reverse here. And that's, so I, I will be moving uh, that. How many variances are being asked and requested on this application altogether? Through you, Mr. Chairman. One moment, please. Mr. Chairman, uh, 10 variances, some of which are performance standards, some of which are to acknowledge the fact that this is a, uh, a form of development that wasn't contemplated when the original zoning bylaw was done, that being the vacant land condominium. Appreciate it. So we're not dealing with 20 variances, we're dealing with a minimum amount of variances in a very minor nature, uh, which I appreciate. I have been uh, working and, and, and dealing with the residents in the area and haven't had any concerns about this uh, particular development. And that's the people that actually live there day to day. Not, not developers, but I'm talking about the people who live there day to day. Um, the other uh, uh, parking, parking is always an issue, and this is you know fairly intense. And units, 
Um, are they exceeding the parking regulations? Through you, Mr. Chairman. For the um, condominium block, which is, although it's considered street townhouses, it's essentially a block townhouse type of development with an alternative form of tenure. Um, those typically require 0 0.3 parking spaces, visitor parking spaces per unit, and they are um, just marginal, they're meeting it. It's a fraction above it. Having said that though, um, the concept plan that they have provided are based on um, parking stall sizes of three meters by six meters, so they were conservative on that. When we get down and dealing with the site plan stage, we may find we're able to accommodate additional parking spaces based on our newer standards. And then, well, they have some driveways, I understand, that are, are, uh, can accommodate double cars over and above the garage, is that correct? That, that may be the case. I think it would probably be better for the proponent to indicate the type of units they're proposing okay. on the property. And can uh, uh, some parking also be accommodated? Because there's always concern about pressure on the, and that was Parkview's concern, uh, uh, Parkbrook Church. Uh, this, this public roadway can provide additional parking uh, without putting any pressure on current neighborhoods. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a standard condition in the um, plan of subdivision requiring that they, they provide a parking plan, demonstrate to them it's a, it's a, a city guideline of, of the 40 percent um, parking. However, with this predominantly being used for stormwater management block at the, at the, at the current time, um, that is something that we'll have to assess the, the, the merits of at, at that time. Okay, so um, at this committee, uh, it's always been concerned with these kind of developments, the pressure that parking uh, uh, puts on uh, uh, on the street or on other neighborhoods. Um, do you believe that the current parking uh, lotted in this particular development and the potential for more through the site plan uh, would be more than adequate? Uh, plenty of staff are satisfied that it's met the standards for parking. Okay. Now there was a... a Something I circled here because it wasn't clear what it. Uh... I can go to Councillor Partridge. Come back to you, Councillor, if you like. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll look for you as a second time speaker. We only have one other, and that is Councillor Partridge at this time. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And actually, my concerns were uh, with regards to the stormwater management ponds, and um, I had a, a very thorough explanation, which I uh, I do appreciate. So I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Committee members interested in asking questions here? So we'll go back to you for a second time. To the ward councillor, councillor Whitehead. I'd rather refer to it as a continuance. Okay. <laughs> Part uh, two. Acknowledgement that there will be no city share for any municipal works associated with this development. Can you provide some clarity on that? That's within the report on page, uh, what's the page? Page two of 25. Item triple I. Through the top, chair, top of the page. Through the chair to the councillor. Uh, the city has approved financial policies as related to uh, cost sharing, and at this point in time, there's no oversizing or uh, elements that require city uh, contribution, except for the ultimate uh, swim pond uh, when it's located. I appreciate. Now, uh, on page 20 of 25. For further provisions have been included to allow townhouse units located at the corners of Condium and Rose to be within 1.5 meters of radii of the streets, if necessary. The purpose of this provision is to allow the option for Condium and Rose to be built with more tapered corners to allow municipal waste collection trucks to travel through the site. Is that agreed upon by the uh, developer as well? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Yes, the, that turning radius. Uh, just, just to be clear, though, um, the, the agreement for municipal vehicles to go through the site hasn't been determined yet. But the 30, 13 meter turning radius is, is something that the uh, the uh, proponent has agreed to, and is in fact will be reflected in the uh, common element condominium when it's registered. Okay, those are all the questions I have. Thank you, and seeing no further questions, let's uh, now receive the staff presentation. That's moved by Councillor Partridge and seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Sure. Seeing none opposed. We want to invite now the agent, Mr. Glenn Wellings, to come forward at this time with the owner's presentation. Could I suggest, Mr. Chair? That yes, Councillor. My, my, my preference would be uh, if, there's, if there's concerns about this particular development, we hear about those concerns. Instead of having uh, the uh, 
developer come up here uh, just at the front end, he might be able to respond to those concerns at the same time making the presentation. I have absolutely no issue with that, but I'll, uh, I'll see what the uh, committee feels. We have recently changed the order, and this is the I'm new order, but uh, I appreciate where you're coming from. Uh, I don't see any uh, pushback, so why not? So if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Wellings, we will uh, skip you for now, bring you back after we hear from the public. We do, it appears, have uh, two individuals present wishing to speak to this issue. So members of the public wishing to address committee, please come down to the podium. Write your name, address, and postal code and telephone number on the sheet provided prior to speaking. It looks like the two advanced public speakers would be David Tang and Stephen uh, Zickham. Zickham. Whoops. Got it. Just checking to, to see whether I should be saying good afternoon or good morning, but good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of committee. Um, my name is David Tang. I'm the solicitor for LPF Realty Retail Inc., which is the which stands for the Leona uh, Pension Fund, um, uh, which is of course the Labor International Union. Uh, of, of North America Pension Fund, which owns the land, and if I, if uh, if council or committee doesn't mind, I'll just go to uh, Appendix G, which gives you a sense of where we are. My client's land uh, is essentially this parcel up here. Um, it is, as you know, developed uh, currently with a retail plaza that, is, uh, that has been operational. Uh, and my client has made applications, three applications at this time, for the rear of those lands, the portions that are essentially in white, um, for uh, three things. There's an official plan amendment and a rezoning bylaw application uh, to change the use of that land from its current uh, zoning and designation, which is residential, to uh, to commercial because one of the things that they need is they need some additional parking on the rear of that plaza to continue to service the neighborhood and uh, so that's the first part of it and then the second part of that rezoning is to permit the rear of that site which has been the identified location of the storm water management facility that everybody's been talking about for this entire area to be uh, designated and zoned uh, conservation lands for the purpose of that stormwater uh, facility. So we have gone through a very long uh, process. It has been identified. What this is doing is implementing the results of that, uh, that, that lengthy study that we've been talking about that's been ongoing since uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, at this point almost uh, more, than a, more than a decade. Uh, the, uh, the third application is a severance to uh, sever off the conservation stormwater uh, management facility lands uh, to once again implement the, the, the long-term um, uh, vision for, for this neighborhood. The, um, what, so what we're seeing here um, uh, is we're seeing this community moving ahead towards development. Um, and though that application, which unfortunately wasn't actually described in the report that you have on this, uh, on, on the Sonoma application, uh, is, is well underway. We know that the, um, and I believe Mr. Zakim is going to speak about these lands, which are also subject to an application. I believe there's at least one or two other pieces of land in the neighborhood that are also subject to, um, to Planning Act applications at this time. And I guess the point here is that in this context, moving ahead with one application uh, is essentially piecemeal development of what has long been uh, a singular vision for, for this entire neighborhood. The Mewburn neighborhood plan has been around for a long time. And we know because the recommendations that came forward from staff, the fourth recommendation specifically says you need to after you approve this, amend the Mewburn secondary plan. Now that's always seemed to me like that's backwards. That really what we should be doing is encouraging you to consider the Mewburn secondary plan, finalize both the road patterns that have to be amended to facilitate this particular application, to finalize the, the designation and use of these lands that my client has an application in on, figure exactly how much land should be set aside for that, for that, um, that uh, stormwater management facility, zone it, 
sever it and permit it to be used and to, and to negotiate uh, the actual acquisition and construction of that facility. So we don't have to have a situation which we have in this proposal, which is a temporary stormwater management pond here and a whole bunch of conditions, but, and I would submit to you not enough conditions, frankly, for that temporary situation to then transition into a permanent one. The permanent solution is essentially here. Uh, it simply requires us to put my client's applications and some of the other applications in the area in the same hopper to work through this process, if not in order of Mewbury, uh, uh, Mewburn neighborhood plan first, followed by all of these rezonings, o uh, OPAs and, and subdivision applications, at least do them all together. That would give, I think, the city the opportunity to more comprehensively plan this area, doing it in the other fashion, in other words, to do just this one piece of land first is frankly premature uh, and is, uh, in my view, uh, contrary to some of the policies in your official plan uh, and uh, is inappropriate development given the fact that essentially the balance of these lands are ready and not only ready, but are actually um, in the process of being considered by your staff uh, to uh, complete the, the, this, this vision for this entire neighborhood. So those are, those are essentially my uh, suggestions at this time, is to say that um, the order of the approval of, this, uh, of these applications is slightly ahead of where they should be. It's not that they have to be held back for years, what we have to do is move ahead with the other applications, finalize the shape of this plan, and en enable that to go. Uh, the alternative, obviously, would be to consider making that stormwater management pond that they're proposed permanent. If that's, in fact, the, the solution, then, then we can do that. And then that permits us to figure out what the shape and size and configuration of the integrated pond should be. But until you've done that, you're really sort of leaving this piece of land um, sitting, uh, sitting out there with insufficient certainty as to what its long-term um, uh, role should be. Uh, and as I've looked at the subdivision conditions that are, in the, uh, that are recommended to you, you I would uh, commend to you the conditions specifically uh, number Number 11, which is found at page 2 of 4 of Appendix E, as in Edward. That condition does provide for a temporary stormwater management pond that says the owner shall agree to operate and maintain in an acceptable manner a private temporary stormwater management facility in accordance with the MOE certificate of approval until such time as established by the senior director. What it fails to do, and there is no other condition in, in, this sub, in these subdivision conditions that does this, is put appropriate conditions in place to ensure that Sonoma, this developer, pays for the cost of transitioning into a permanent um, uh, stormwater management facility for the entire area. So that I would suggest to you must be a condition for this, for this, uh, for this particular approval, nor does it put into place the appropriate uh, conditions for or the collection of appropriate securities to enable uh, that this developer pays for its fair share of the stormwater management facilities for the entire neighborhood that the others uh, in the neighborhood will be required to do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tang. A uh, question from Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, just on that last note, isn't that what development charges pay for? Uh, development charges, if they are fully, if they uh, fully capture all of the costs of the entire, um, of the entire um, growth and re related the issues, entire. as opposed uh, relative to development, is what development charges are for. Ponds are developed to meet that growth related issue. Obviously, development charges are allocated purposely to deal with these kinds of issues. So I'm trying to understand what the, where the hiccup is. I, I have not, um, uh, Councillor, uh, through you, um, um, Mr. Chair, had an opportunity to review the uh, development charges Fair report enough. and study to determine whether everything at this point is in this in the development charges. 
Okay, no further questions. Move to receive the uh, delegation. Moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Tank. Uh, Stephen Sakeman. I guess I can say good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of committee, and thank you for the opportunity to address you uh, this afternoon. Um, my name is Stephen Zakem. I'm a municipal solicitor with the law firm of Ayrton Burles LLP, and appear before you uh, this afternoon on behalf of Dicenzo Construction Company Limited, uh, or DCCL. And there is a submission from me in your package um, for your review and consideration. Um, DCCL owns the lands immediately to the north of the subject site uh, in the Mewburn neighborhood plan area, which you see in the, on the screen in front of you. The Sonoma site is now shown in pink on that slide. That is the school board site, which was my understanding, contrary to the, to the staff presentation, was it's actually been purchased by a by, I'm sorry. We're asking the clerk to dim the lights is all. You, you, you can blame me. I often get blamed for things that aren't my fault. Not, not at all. I'm sorry. Is that better? Okay. So that's the, that's the Mewburn neighborhood area. And you can see there's some existing development uh, along Upper James, and it's oriented, of course, to the north. So there's the Sonoma application that's before you today. There's the school board site that was, well, the former school board site that's now been purchased, my understanding is it's now been purchased by uh, developers. There's the Leuna site that uh, Mr. Tang just spoke to you about, which is partially developed and which is proposed to uh, contain uh, the stormwater management facility for the community. This is the numbered company site, um, 1804487 uh, Ontario Inc., which has filed applications for development of a retirement home and some residential, uh, or some residences as well. And then there's the Dicenzo, my client's site, which has applications filed. So when you look at that, and the reason we did it this way is to drop in and have you understand, hopefully clearly, that this entire undeveloped area within this community is either the subject of applications in the case of the numbered company, Dicenzo and um, Leuna, or a pending application in the case of the school board lands. And earlier on previous matters, I think a couple of councillors, uh, Clark and I believe Councillor Johnson spoke about holistically dealing with a particular area, comprehensively dealing with a particular area. And in our respectful submission, um, this cries out for comprehensive development. It's not a case of Sonoma's here and nobody else is out there with any applications. In that circumstance, and I act for a lot of developers, it's not fair to hold people up. Where you have an opportunity like this, to comprehensively plan this neighborhood. It actually rarely happens, and it's a golden opportunity here to not only achieve development, but to achieve public uh, interest objectives in terms of planning for an entire community. So my letter sets out those, those various applications and pending uh, applications. And as Mr. Tang pointed out, the Mewburn, uh, the recommendation talks about a, 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 an amendment required to the Mewburn uh, uh, plan. And again, we recognize that that plan is a 1987 plan. It's out of date. There's going to be changes to it. But you can't change one part of it without looking at how that's going to affect the remaining parts. Here is an overlay showing the different sites that I just went through and the old road pattern, 
for the, ex uh, should say old road pattern, the existing road pattern in the Mewburn neighborhood plan. Hopefully you can see that in blue, dotted blue, original road pattern, and then the proposed road pattern uh, shown in brown. So again, there are significant changes to the road network for this entire community that are being uh, contemplated through the various applications that are presently before the city for consideration. Here's, a, here's an, another look at the, a comparison between the sort of um, uh, neighborhood plan as built versus the proposed sites. Again, you can see that the large part of the unbuilt, uh, unbuilt part of the neighborhood is the subject now of applications. Thought I had one more slide. Um, and let me just go back. You can see it's, it's hard to see, but um, right here, that's the storm pond. And you see the cross hatching here. That, again, this pond is, is, is the subject of discussions between the city, um, Leuna here, and my client, DCCL, in terms of the size and configuration of the pond. And my client is perfectly prepared to, make, to continue with those discussions so that uh, the pond from day one in this, for this community is established. And in fact, the Leuna consent application to create their parcel to convey their portion of the park is going to a uh, committee of adjustment, I believe, on Thursday evening. So again, it's not a case of, well, we will be filing, we might be filing. It's a case of active applications presently before the city for review. In terms of servicing and transportation, it's quite easy to say, as the staff report does, that you know we're lot, this street is going to line up with Dicenzo's proposed street, which it is, and that's good. But we don't know, for example, is this configuration acceptable to the city? Uh, if it's not, what is the configuration that's going to be acceptable? Uh, my client might decide that if the city wants a different configuration that the connection with Sonoma shouldn't be built. So how do you, how, you can't unring the Sonoma bell until you've looked at the, at, the, at the community comprehensively. In terms of densities, the Sonoma development is fairly dense, as is my client's proposal. Developers aren't shy in ask, asking for density. And while we don't disagree in principle with the Sonoma densities, we need to understand what is the servicing capacity for this community. Because is Sonoma going to scoop all the density from everybody else? In that case, we do have a problem with the Sonoma density. Is there enough for everybody and the stormwater management pond can handle it? Great. Let's, let's move ahead. What's the mix of densities? Is it all going to be townhomes? Is there going to be a mix? Who sh where should that mix go? Who should get what, what types of densities? How do you plan that comprehensively? So in terms of transportation and servicing, we have concerns. My client is presently in negotiations with the city um, in the Sheldon neighborhood where uh, a proposed land exchange is, is, has been put before the city. Uh, and the comment from staff there uh, was, that, you know, your plan looks good, it has merit, but we need to piece it together in a comprehensive plan with abutting properties to establish the appropriate servicing and phasing. We understand that comment, makes sense to us, that's not, that's not with respect being done here. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit like building a house, building a kitchen, before you've poured the foundation for the house. So in conclusion, uh, members of committee, my request is not that you deny this application, but that you refer it back to staff to be brought back with a report on the other active applications in the area, together with a report on changes to the Mewburn community 
as a whole that would result from the recommendations of staff. Thank you very much. All right, we have, thank you for the presentation. We have Councillor, I, did I miss you right off the top? Okay, uh, we'll get to the work, Councillor, two speakers before from committee. Councillor Johnson followed by Councillor Clark. I will defer to the ward councillor. Councillor Clark. Wants to go first. Councillor Whitehead. Um, there's uh, an applicant, your client currently has an application in? Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's referenced on page seven of 25 of the report. I'm not sure if it's a different page in your package. Uh, and my understanding is the, the, the other piece you identified, there's a current application in as well. Actually, the, all the the the, the, uh, the locations you identified. Every single one has an application. Applications. In. Sorry, I'm sorry. Every single one has an active application, except, as I understand it, school the board. school board lands. Correct. So the staff have had an opportunity to uh, over the last period to take a look at these applications as it, as it aligns in this neighborhood. Is that correct? In fairness to them. Um, They've had a brief opportunity. I think our application was filed towards the end of 2012. I'm not sure when the the notice of completion for the um, for the um, other application was February. So, the, so, so the the retirement home site was notice of completion was February 22nd, 2013. So, to be fair to staff. I'm not criticizing them, saying they should have looked at ours by now. I, I, I think ours came a little bit later, and so did the, and then the other one a little bit later after that. So I wouldn't say that staff have had a chance to look at it comprehensively. Yeah, but I guess uh, the point I'm making is that these applications are before uh, staff, and they've had an opportunity to do the cursory look, and 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 uh, maybe even further than that, to understand the context of what is being asked for in this in, the, in this area. That that's the. Uh, 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 Councillor, with with all due respect, I think you should ask staff that question. But but uh, but they, whether they've had that opportunity or not, they haven't done it. In my respectful submission, it's not evident in this report. They haven't even mentioned the Leona applications. They haven't mentioned the other uh, application. They've only mentioned my client's application for the purposes of showing that the road is connecting where we're where we're showing a road. So I don't think staff have looked at it. Uh, in your application, is it not show what where is the road? being shown uh, connecting in your application? Our road is right here. Shared with the, can you see that? Yeah. Sorry. Our road is shown here and coming back down here. And so it's shown as being shared with the school board site. So, so it's, it's consistent with uh, the alignment of this particular development? Our proposed road is consistent with what Sonoma is now showing. Okay. I think Sonoma was modified to line up with ours, but ours hasn't been approved by staff yet or, or council. Thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Johnson. Yes, thank you very much. Um, through you, Chair, you were talking about density issues. So if the density of this application could, in fact, in your opinion, affect the capacity uh, of the rest of the infrastructure, correct? Yes. Capacity or timing. Okay. It may be that it, it, it just affects the timing of or, or phasing of development. So if I can just put this in my own simple terms through you, Chair, you're suggesting that there's so much capacity for the infrastructure designed for this area and your wish is to, to look at everything holistically so that everybody's capacities would match up, that they would all, that the capacity would, would um, why I'm not getting this equally shared or that combined it, the capacity could handle the density correct so the, that the, the last part so to, right. to put it another way counselor uh, we would want to know what is the what is the servicing and transportation capacity for this neighborhood and how much is that and then how is it divided amongst the the, the different parcels of land that are available for development okay thank you and and so you don't have a problem with the road structure because you know that it matches up with the, the road structure right now that you're planning. But you do have a, a, an issue with the density because it may not, the capacity may not hold everybody's ideas and applications coming through. You want everybody to come in at the same time so the capacity will right. handle everything. I don't know if I have a problem with the road structure, road structure until council tells me that my proposed road is okay. So 
So right now, the, the way that they're showing the road lines up with the way we're proposing the road. If the city were to say your road DCCL is okay, um, then the way Sonoma has their road works for us as presently proposed. So I, I'm not trying to skirt your question, but I can't say yet until staff tell me they're okay with the road that I'm okay with the Sonoma road. Okay, so it's, it's a bit you, chicken chair. and egg. So through you, Chair, I'm taking a look at this, and it's very similar to the Scooby plan, doing everything holistically, making sure everybody's on the same page, making sure the capacity is there, the road infrastructure is all there. Right. So just as a curiosity question, the, the foothills of Winona Phase 2 actually exempted or jump-started ahead of the Scooby process. So how could you argue one and not the other? So if, if the foothills of Winona came through without the Scooby process being approved, and the capacity was not approved, then why can't we just allow this to happen just as we did with the foothills of Winona too? The, the, well, there's two, two answers to that. First of all, the Scooby process has been ongoing for a very lengthy period of time. But secondly, the official plan provides for someone to accelerate their development if they meet certain requirements that came out of Scooby. In other words, that you look holistically at the servicing and the transportation, and things like that. So Scooby didn't say you had to wait. Scooby set up a framework in which applications could be, con could be considered. And through you, Chair, you don't believe this is the same no. terminology or the same intent here? Not at all. There's been no comprehensive review of this neighborhood at all. None. It's evident from the report, which says, after this application is approved, as Mr. Tang says, we're going to have to amend the neighborhood plan. Well, you're going to, how many times are you going to amend it before? I mean, intuitively, it makes no sense to amend a neighborhood plan for one application. It's a neighborhood plan, not an application plan or a Sonoma plan. So there's been nothing like that done here. It's a 1987 plan. Okay, and one last question. You said something about the future development of the school, and I and you said it the first time until we had to uh, regrettably ask you to stop so we could get the lights turned down. But you were talking about the future development for the school lands. Can you remember what you said? Yes, that that site has been sold by the school board to a residential developer. Thank you. That's and that applications are pending, is my understanding. Okay, thank you. That's the part I missed. Thank you. That's okay. Councillor Clark. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, for process guy, this is really fascinating, this, this uh, uh, situation we have here at the present time. So I'm, I'm trying to reconcile, what the hell's going on here? I'm trying to uh, reconcile, normally what we do, um, it's first in, first out. It's the applications come in once the work is completed, planning passes them, and off we go. And we don't tend to look at um, developments or subject properties um, in that holistic approach, even if we know there's other applications coming. It's just really the first in, and we deal with it. The next guy has to deal with that, and on and on and on. So how am I supposed to reconcile our normal process with regards to individual property rights of the developers who are currently um, in the hopper with your suggestion that we would back up and in essence do a comprehensive municipal review of the entire neighborhood and come up with in essence a, a small secondary plan. That's, that's a very fair question, Councillor, and I guess it, it comes back to it comes back to, and of course, as elected officials, you're the you're the you're the people I think best best um, equipped to deal with this. But it comes back to a balance between land use planning and planning means planning, and the public interest and the rights of individual landowners to develop their land and proceed with development. So in this case, the way I would, I submit, I would ask you to look at it is, what is the balance of convenience? You've got an application here that's before you recommended for approval. You've got three other applications immediately in the same area, in the same neighborhood, that are before the city being circulated and available for uh, comment. So for the sake of, I don't know, three months or six months, whatever it would take to finish the review of those applications and review the neighborhood, um, you could have a comprehensive uh, approach to this neighborhood with a modest delay for the developer 
Uh, to me, the balance is clearly in, in, in and I'm, I'm, I'm here for my client, but I think it's pretty, pretty obvious to me the balance is in favor of uh, referring this back to staff and you know, asking them to expedite the other applications if you're concerned about timing and bring forward a, a comprehensive plan. It's not a huge neighborhood. It's, I mean, it's a neighborhood, but it's not, it's not, like, uh, not an area the size of, for example, as Councillor Johnson referred to, Scooby. It, this is a, 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 a third to a half of the area is developed. So I, I don't think it is a huge exercise um, uh, to do this, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What would your response be if I were to say that, uh, listening very carefully to the presentations this morning, it would appear to me that it's really a fight over where the stormwater management pond goes? I, no, I don't agree with that because even the developer is saying the pond can go where it looks like it's going to go. The developer's just saying, I'll put in a temporary pond so I don't have to wait for that pond to go in. So it's not a fight of where the pond is going to go. It's a it, it's an issue of it's an issue of what is the impact of this development on the surrounding lands. That's what the fight is about. So I, I don't th I, with respect I don't think it's related to the pond. Okay. They're trying to get out ahead of the, of the the finalization of this pond uh, and are prepared to to isolate some of their lands for that purpose. It seems kind of wasteful to me, but that's that's what they're trying to do. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with respect to the four or five different applications that are before our planning staff and each one, and I will have a list for asking questions of our staff, they're generally assessed based on uh, the proposal and the studies that have been completed when they're ready for approval, if they're ready for approval. Um, how, do, how do we and I'm trying to word this in a manner not to appear uh, disparaging, but what's to prevent one developer from trying to utilize the comprehensive municipal review or a comprehensive neighborhood review really just to leverage um, their development into the hopper quicker? Uh, uh, let, me be, let me be frank. Um, Councillor, that, that if, if this development is approved, my client is going to have no choice but to appeal it to the Ontario Municipal Board. He would rather sit down and work with the city and the other landowners and have it decided here at the city in a cooperative way. Now that's not a threat. I'm, I want to be frank and upfront with you that that's going to be our only alternative because we see this as detrimental, potentially detrimental to our interests and premature. So. Approving it today, again with all due respect, is not going to speed it up. Probably going to slow it down. Mike. Thank you. Um, so it's not about leveraging a better position for your client, but if we approve this today, it's going to the OMB to argue for your client's position. My client's going to, my, it's not about leverage, it's about protection. My client doesn't know what impact the, this application is going to have on the city's position on its application. In other words, I don't know if staff are going to say, well, now that Sonoma's approved DCCL, um, we, uh, they've, they, they, they've got townhomes, and now we want you to do singles, for example. We'd like to know that now. And maybe, maybe, we, maybe my client would build singles, I don't know, or semis or whatever. What is the mix of housing? How's it going to be serviced? How are the roads going to work? Where are the access points going to be? How is, essentially, how's the neighborhood going to be planned? So it's not about leverage, it's about protection. And so what, with regards respect, Mr. Chairman, um, Council, what's, what's the difference? Why should your, count, your client be treated differently than any other subject property that's before us. It's first in, first out, based on the, the assessment of our staff. It's not about um, the density. You, 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 your client will have to argue the density, the use of the land based on the decisions that have already been made. You've, we've got um, a subject property with an application here that's in advance of you. 
you're arguing, in essence, that his rights, your client's rights, are more important than, than his rights to develop his property, that we have to slow everything down and make a decision on all five properties, when historically we don't do that. I, 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 we've never done that. I, I've been doing this for over 20 years. Now, I haven't been before Hamilton very often, Hamilton Council, but I've been doing this for over 20 years. And in my experience, in a scenario like this, this uh, most municipalities that I've appeared in front of would never proceed with this single application when you've got this many additional applications in the immediate area already in the, in the hopper. So I've been slowed down many times for clients who have been the first in, on the basis that for the, for the sake of a few months to do this properly. So I understand the first, look, I'm always arguing, like, let's go, let's, let's hurry up council, hurry up staff, we want to get this done, I understand that. But in, I go back to the balance equ equation, that in this set of circumstances, that a, a, a slight delay in that application is appropriate. And I would expect to be similarly delayed and have been delayed by um, where I've been the first in on a similar application. Now you have that on, on record. Mr. DiCenzo may not like that, but that's, uh, I would expect if, he, if, he, if, if, if the tables were switched here, if Mr. DiCenzo was in the place of Sonoma and vice versa, that he'd be slowed down until those applications were dealt with together. That would be your expectations? Yes, sir. <laughs> in order to plan for this neighborhood properly and in a comprehensive way, absolutely. It hasn't been my experience, uh, Council. Um, well, then that's so important. I, that's important. I understand why committee does not want to treat this applicant different, through you, Mr. Chairman, this applicant different than you have in the past with other applications. So I understand that. I just hope that in this set of circumstances, you see the merit for doing that. I understand the merit of approaching the application on the holistic planning, if you want to look at it from that standpoint. What I'm having a real challenge is reconciling in my mind the rights of the individual property owner who is now in the hopper arguing for specific density, arguing for specific use, and you're arguing on behalf of your client that that right should be taken back and all of the uses of all of the five properties should be considered with density all at the same time, which in essence could, could, um, a disadvantage the subject property owner that's before us now. I think I'd say it a little bit differently that I'm asking you to base your decision on this application on better information that you don't yet have. One can't argue whether or not it's better information if we don't have it. That's Well, that's right, and I'm saying you should have it before you make the decision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Any you for other your questions time. for the speaker? We have a second time, Councillor Whitehead. Move to receive, Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Pearson, all in favor? None opposed, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Zick. Thank you, sir. All right, anyone else wishing to address committee on this item? Anyone else wishing to address committee on this item? Okay, let's go back to uh, Glenn Wellings. We're gonna invite now the agent to come forward uh, with the owner's presentation. <laughs> While they're getting set up, committee, just something to think about following this item. Maybe we need to um, contemplate going in camera. We do have some uh, high priced staff we've been waiting. And if we could uh, bypass the rest of the agenda and get right to our in camera segment. No, no presentation. Yeah. Have you seen enough? <laughs> yeah. I'll have to wait with this. Yeah. Uh, hi, Mr. Chairman, committee members. I know it's been a long um, debate here, but I'll try and make it brief. Uh, first of all, we do have our team up top there sitting together, Mike on Carmen, Chair of Valley, uh, Jack Restivo, other solicitor, and Ange Gattai, the consulting engineer. And we've certainly been listening in, intently to the discussion. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, we've worked extremely hard with city staff to get to this point in the process, and it's been a, been a long one-year process several changes to the plan, um, uh, several technical discussions with city staff. We've made amendments to the plan to not only accommodate city staff's concerns, but also the concerns of DiCenzo, as well as the school board. Um, we, we've tried our best, um, and, and certainly we want to move forward with this. 
Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Chris Bell for, for handling this application. He's done yeoman's work um, and his professionalism uh, should be acknowledged. It's been a difficult file for sure. We are in agreement with the recommendations before you and the conditions as well. Uh, we do have a concern, however, with the temporary turning circle. Quite frankly, we don't feel it's required, and there, there is ample turnaround room uh, without the temporary turning circle, but that's the only concern uh, I would like to cite within the conditions. Uh, we also anticipate further discussions with city staff regarding the improvements required to West 5th. Um, in terms of uh, both uh, cost and extent of those improvements, but that is addressed uh, thoroughly in the conditions. Uh, I don't think it was mentioned, but there was a public open house hosted by Councillor Whitehead back in, I believe it was uh, April of 2012. And actually it was uh, one of the more pleasant public open houses I attend, I've attended because people were fairly supportive of the development concept and the concerns were, were not the development itself, but just some more technical side of things. So it was a very positive experience. But in terms of uh, the, the plan revisions that we have undertake, undertaken to the plan, uh, first of all, contrary to some of the public comments, we're not working opposite to the secondary plan in place. We, we uh, are not revisiting this neighborhood plan. We're simply looking at certain refinements to accommodate uh, the proposed development which is fairly standard practice in considering uh, site-specific development applications. Uh, some of the key changes that have been undertaken in response to both the city comments and public comments is a provision for a 20-meter uh, public right-of-way. The initial application did not have a public right-of-way. It did have strictly private roads. And that was a concern of not only city staff, but it was also a concern of the school board and a concern of, of the Dicenzo representatives. Uh, we've also provided for a centralized amenity area. Uh, enhancement of the overall visitor parking. I will talk a bit about parking, Mr. Chairman, shortly. And we've identified the road widening, daylighting, and radii uh, as per uh, city staff requirements. So there has been several changes. The changes have resulted in an overall reduction of the number of townhouse units. We started at 131. Uh, we're now down to 121 in terms of the, the overall numbers. Uh, with respect to parking, just to, to sort of carry on with the, the earlier discussion, the, we do exceed the city bylaw requirements in terms of parking standards. Um, there will be two parking spaces per unit, one in the driveway, one in the garage, which is fairly standard. There will be 42 visitor parking spaces, which equates to a standard of 0.35 spaces per unit, which is above the city requirement of 0.3 spaces. In addition to that, there will be 10 units with double car driveways, so that's 10 additional uh, parking spaces, plus potential for at least another nine spaces within the public right of way. So, so adding all that up, there is, on a per unit basis, there would be over 2.5 spaces per unit, which well exceeds uh, the, the city standard and to me is appropriate. I do deal with townhouse developments throughout the greater Toronto area and Gold, greater Golden Horseshoe. This is an appropriate parking standard. In terms of the stormwater pond, um, you've heard quite a bit of discussion on the, the, the intent uh, to proceed with a temporary stormwater pond. And, and obviously there's, there's some concerns, but uh, I want to be very clear on the intent of, of, of Sonoma Homes. The temporary pond is intended to advance the Sonoma Homes development, um, but having said that, it is throwaway cost for them. They don't want to do it, um, but frankly, it's the only way they see of advancing their development. Um, contrary to the, the previous delegations, they're not moving fast at all. Uh, actually, the only time we seem to hear from these people is when they want to oppose the Sonoma Homes development. We don't get phone calls with them. They don't coordinate design discussions with us. It, to me, it's, it seems like they're, they're more intent on frustrating the, the, the process and frustrating the Sonoma applications. And to me, that's frustrating. 
it would be Sonoma's preference to proceed with a permanent stormwater pond facility, but it's the timing is, is not known. Um, the previous two delegations provided no indication to you as to timing of when they want to move forward. So Sonoma Homes, they can no longer afford to wait for under, underperforming developers to move their developments forward. And I hope they do move, move their developments forward because if they're quick enough and can provide that permanent stormwater facility, then Sonoma will be able to develop the temporary stormwater pond location for four more units. That's what they want to do. Um, but the temporary solution is the only solution that they see as being appropriate right now, given the timing of other developments and the, the lack of, of, of those developments moving forward. But this is not to say that Sonoma is not committed to this neighborhood plan and not committed to a permanent stormwater facility. And I think the uh, Councillor Whitehead, the discussion came up um, on development charges. Sonoma will be paying full development charges, of which those development charges will be contributing to the permanent stormwater pond facility. So, so they're not they're not trying to circumvent anything here. They're trying to move their development forward and, and build homes. And I fail to see how these other developers are are prejudiced by this temporary stormwater facility because eventually these lands will drain into a permanent facility. So I do agree with Mr. Zakum's comments. It's not fair to hold people up. It's not. And so Sonoma deserves to, to, to move forward. But let's not penalize Sonoma or delay Sonoma for bringing their applications forward because that would certainly reward the other developers for procrastination, which, which is, in my estimation, is what's happened here. If they want to advance their developments and go quickly, that's great, and Sonoma would be fully supportive of that, but that just doesn't seem to be happening. In terms of other, there are other developments that were not mentioned by Mr. Zakum, uh, developments on the west side, um, on the south side, that have not made applications. Is Sonoma expected to wait for those people as well? Right? It's just, it's a slippery slope here, Mr. Chairman, and, and certainly they, they, they want to move this forward uh, today. In terms of uh, some of the other comments raised by uh, Mr. Tang, first of all, this being piecemeal, premature, not at all. It, it's not, and, and planning staff certainly doesn't agree with that because this will ultimately feed into the overall secondary plan. In terms of making that ter temporary pond permanent, as suggested by Mr. Tang, that's not of an interest to Sonoma at all because that would be contrary to the secondary plan and it would prevent Sonoma from developing the temporary storm pond location for additional units. They want to build homes, but that's what they, they, they don't want to maintain temporary stormwater facilities. They would prefer a permanent solution, but it, it's about timing here. And uh, back to Mr. Zakum in, in his uh, presentation, uh, he never gives firm timelines on when they want to move forward, when they want to build homes. He, I, I didn't hear any of that from Mr. Zakum, which only leads me to believe that, that there's not firm timelines in place. And, and again, that, that could lead to further delay of Sonoma. It's ironic, and I mentioned it earlier, that we only hear from, from, from these property owners when it's time to oppose Sonoma going forward. We never hear from these people in terms of coordinating design, looking at how we can consolidate efforts moving forward, facilitate the permanent pond. We just don't have those discussions, which is, to me, unfortunate. Mr. Zakum said this is not about leveraging. This is totally about leveraging, Mr. Chairman and committee members. And, and, and certainly, uh, we don't want any part of it. We want to move forward. And if they choose to appeal, so be it. But that should not be a reason for committee to not deal with this application or these applications today. 
And in terms of the, the latest Dicenzo concept, I, I noticed when I reviewed it, it doesn't even show a, a stormwater pond facility, which I, I found ironic. Um, I understand that part of the permanent facility is supposed to be on these lands. The latest concept I saw, it doesn't show it. So, so I'm wondering what the end game is there. So Mr. Chairman, that's all I have to say today. And uh, thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Wellings. Uh, motion. Um any questions for the presenter? Yeah, I think the only thing I heard uh, um, in regards to this particular proposal as prepared by staff is the need for the, uh, the turn circle. Uh, so what would you say, uh, understanding this is a standard, is a needed standard for our own facilities, uh, I try to highlight um, the, the fact that we have uh, roadways that can accommodate the garbage trucks and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, but I didn't really hear an argument other than there's not a need for it from mm -hmm. yourself. Uh, why uh, the turning circle at this point wouldn't be needed. Yeah, yeah. through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to, to Councillor Whitehead. Uh, first of all, the turning circle, in my experience with temporary turning circles, it's, they are provided in most cases where there's not proper turnaround uh, facilitated through the remainder of the development. But in this case, if you look at the, the private road layout, there is proper turnaround. There's an entire loop system that's been designed to accommodate municipal vehicles, city vehicles, garbage trucks, emergency vehicles. So I, I see the, the temporary turning circle as really redundant because there is adequate turnaround uh, in place. In my experience elsewhere, where there is not adequate turnaround, I, I understand why it's required. Thank you. That's the only question I have. Councillor Clark. No, I'm fine. Okay, move to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And at this point, I believe I should probably close just to be on the record. The public. Um, did I did I do that, Madam Clerk? Okay, the public presentation is closing the public. Wait, I'll ask one more time. Is there anybody else wishing to address committee? Anybody else wishing to address committee? Anybody else wishing to address committee? Okay, public presentations moved to close. Moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? That's carried. Councillor Whitehead. For staff, for clarification, uh, it was presented. I did see the application uh, for Chichenzos, but I wanted to, uh, to verify whether or not their application uh, shows at all at all uh, a pond on their property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, through the chair, uh, the application uh, submitted by Dicenza does not show a pond at this point. Thank okay. you, so there's the game. Okay, thank you. And now a motion to approve the staff recommendations. Moved by, you can't move it, I'm sorry, your staff, but uh, did you have something final to uh, say? I think through the chair, no, I don't want to move it. But um, I think it's fair to say, though, that we have met with Dicenzo and, and uh, to talk about the pond and that we showed them where the pond would go and impact those lands. So we did ask for um, uh, a, a submission of a concept that shows those that pond on, the, on their lands. Thank you. Councillor Clark? Oh, did, uh, did you still have the floor? Okay, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just some quick questions for Mr. McCabe. Um, listen very carefully to um, uh, opposing counsel's position. Um, I'm trying to reconcile what they're requesting versus what the standard practice is versus what is our statutory responsibility under the Planning Act in terms of making uh, quick decisions. So it was indicated that this is done commonly in other municipalities that um, when there's a number of applications coming forward that the city would delay the approval of the applications and then deal with it in a holistic manner. Have you experienced this before through you, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So if we were into a new secondary plan area and the secondary plan was being done um, and we had draft plans being looked at concurrently, yeah, we would look at it together in order to provide input and, and and uh, consistency with shaping the secondary plan. So we would do it in a case like this. But in this case, there is a neighborhood plan. The changes to the neighborhood plan, in our opinion, are, are minor and only affect this subject property. And uh, the other application, DeCenzo's application, was like a year after this. So, so if we held on to um, not um, carrying out our, our statutory obligation in terms of trying to to uh, bring recommendations before council within 180 days, we would never move the city forward at all. 
So, I mean, we do have to uh, bring before you, we should be bringing before you applications, uh, and uh, our responsibility under the Planning Act is to ensure that uh, it's appropriate development and it's not going to jeopardize uh, adjacent lands, and I think that review has been done and we're satisfied. And uh, another question, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had raised the issue with um, council that was today present that I have a concern with regards to the individual property rights of the developer who's filed the application in a timely manner and now delaying the decision um, so that the other property owners can actually put forth their density concepts and how do we reconcile the rights of the applicants who are already filed here versus the folks who are in essence wanting to slow the process down for whatever reason, doesn't it put the city um, in, in conflict, if you will, if we were to do that? Mr. McCabe. Well, through you, Mr. Chair, so, uh, Councilor Clark, if we had any reason or justification to deem this to be premature, that we didn't have adequate information as professionals to bring this forward, then I think it would be questionable in terms of um, some responsibility and, and responsibility we would have in not being professional. But we've looked at all these situations, and we feel it's appropriate, and it doesn't jeopardize uh, what's coming uh, a year from now or whatever else. And Mr. Giacenzo and others, I mean, they could be off to the board within 180 days too, which is often the case as well. And you may see that in this. Okay. I'm fine, thank you. Councilor Whitehead. Recommendation? The recommendation, sorry, amendment to the recommendation before us. What is that amendment? I don't is, recall. Is, is the, uh, the, the, the that just dead end the uh, the public road because of the uh, the clear access for uh, vehicles. So I want to eliminate that particular condition. Seconded by Councillor Councilor Pearson. Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Any opposed? And now on the original recommendation. On, on so, the Mr. Chair, in order to carry out that uh, that amendment, there would have to be a, a motion to remove the conditions in the subdivision agreement that are in the appendix. I don't have it handy, but. Be to delete or remove conditions X, Y, and Z from Appendix A oh, so. with respect to the um, not requiring the temporary turnaround. Chris, Chris, can you that's Well, that's the essence of it. Thank you. Right. Uh, we'll so we'll, we'll get the word submitting, but that's the essence of the result is that the turning circle would be necessary. Moved by Councillor Whitehead, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carry. Any opposed? Seeing none. Now on to the staff recommendation as amended, moved by Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, could I speak to it? Se you can. Seconded by Councillor Pearson. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've, when I got elected, uh, this was a long, long, long process in regards to determining bringing the sanitary system in. I uh, went through an EA process, I think it was 2004, to determine the storm man management needs. Uh, obviously, there's some developers that were concerned about having a pond on their property. Uh, and got together other developers to try to eliminate one pond and put all the pressure on a park, quite frankly, a city property, as opposed to them taking that pressure, which I thought was completely unfair. But having said that, the process, as it turned out, through the analysis and assessment, determined that that pond was necessary. We've had a very difficult time with one of the developers on this particular uh, property that has delayed development for years, delayed uh, uh, sewer access to homeowners for years. It's been nothing but delay, delay, delay. So I wasn't surprised, Mr. Chair, that we had that representative here today again to argue for a delay. There's been a lot of due diligence on this particular application. Uh, we did have a public hearing, as you indicated, very positive received. Uh, the only issue is obviously parking, and I think they over or exceed the, the parking requirements, as well as the, uh, just fix the road in West Fifth. Everyone wants that West Fifth road uh, fixed. It will be urbanized when these developments take place. So sooner we get these developments in place, uh, the good news for the, the, the community is sooner we can urbanize that road. Because the uh, uh, West Fifth is going to be completely done from the Mountain Brow all the way up to Stone Church. The only remaining piece will be Stone Church to Rymel, and that's where all this development is going to be taking place. And of course, you can't uh, redevelop the road until most of that development 
happens, and it's been way too long. Uh, so I would hope and, and, and trust uh, that, uh, that we can move forward on this application, and I would ask my colleagues to support it. Thank you. So it's moved by Councillor White, it's seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Any opposed? As amended, thank you. And uh, we move on. So I, I was suggesting, uh, committee, that we would move in camera, so we'll pass on the discussion items at this time. With all apologies to Mr. Aarons, who's another high priced individual and only requires five minutes for item 8.1. Uh, even that, I'm sorry, John. Uh, so we'll go to first approving the closed session minutes of April 16th, 2013, and that they may remain confidential. Moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. And now a motion to allow committee to move into closed session to consider items 12.2, 12.3, and 12.4, which are subject to section 239.2 E and F on the Municipal Act and Section 8.1 E and F on the Procedural Bylaw as the subject ma uh, matter of these items pertains to litigation or potential litigation including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the city and the receiving of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege including communications necessary for that purpose. Moved by Pearson, seconded by Clark. All in favor? Any opposed? Let's go into closed section and members of the public, we require you now leave the chambers for this item. Uh, you are welcome to return when committee is finished their closed session discussions. Dust wood laws. And I had an issue with that because as the Councillor Whitehead said, if I want to cut one tree down in my yard, right. I have to go through a huge process. And I didn't think that's fair to citizens on private property. If it's a woodlot, which is why Councillor McCaddy brought this back as a woodlot, I have no problem with addressing it that way. So that I would support, but a tree by law I will not support. And I do not want staff to go down that road again because they've already done all that work. Thank you. And thank you through you, Chair. I'm just, I obviously got the wording screwed up, but that's, I think we're all in the same intent. So as far as getting the wording properly, um, that the tree, would it be the urban? Woodlot. Urban rule, thank you. But I'd also like to um, send this to Ag and Rule as well, just to be on this, because my understanding was a lot of this was killed because of, of their concerns, understandably so. Councillor Johnson, you have the floor, but uh, Paul Mallard may be uh, able to assist. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair to the Councillor, the direction is for urban, so we're not looking at the rural areas as part of this outstanding business list item? We're not looking at... Looking at rural areas? It's strictly I would urban. like... I don't have a problem with looking at rural woodlots as well. Well then, that changes the scope of this and it's a different direction and okay. we, we would have then we'll to... Then cross that, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, so we'll just keep it as urban, urban cutting woodlot. Okay. Woodlands, sorry, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. Councillor Partridge. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I did just want to say I agree with that uh, uh, amendment to the wording and would support it uh, for the urban area. Let's hear it one more time, Councillor Johnson, if it's ready. <laughs> Hoping Vanessa could clean it up. <laughs> Staff be directed to report back on what has transpired since the urban cutting, or sorry, urban woodlands bylaw was denied. And, right? and the staff be directed to, to present the proposed urban woodlot bylaw to the Ag and Rule to discuss amendments agreeable to the agricultural community, which to me still makes sense because we have a lot of urban and, and rural uh, matching up. Okay, save for the um, second part of the motion. It wasn't denied, sorry. Save for the second part of the motion. I'm gonna to turn to Councillor Pearson, but I, I think we have it in the books and it's supposed to come back June 18th. Mr. Chairman, I see staff kind of looking Perplexed. In, perplexed because it that is happens. an outstanding business item. And I, I have no problem though as Councillor Johnson's, the second part of her motion, certainly going forward. But the first part is confusing because staff are already doing that on reporting back. There has been nothing done other than what staff is working on to bring forward to us. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. And uh, I'll take the floor through you. Uh, uh, pass the chair to you, Councillor Johnson. Just for clarity and for the record, Paul Mallard, uh, what Councillor Pearson has said is is true. Yes, no, and uh, are we soon going to receive a uh, report back yeah. on what it is Councillor Johnson is trying to achieve through you, Councillor Johnson? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, it is an outstanding business list item specifically for the uh, urban woodland okay. uh, issue. We have not consulted with the Ag and Rural Affairs Committee because it is an urban uh, issue, direction that we were given for clear cutting in the, in the urban areas. Uh, our intent uh, was to bring this forward in June. Uh, as indicated earlier, we're working on that. I don't know whether we'll meet that date or not, but uh, that's our target. I'll take the chair back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to withdraw this at this time, and I'll probably bring something different in the next planning committee. Fair enough. Thank you. And thank you. It was a good discussion. Good topic. Okay, so 12.2, the recommendation is to uh, be approved and remain confidential until council approval, and that is moved by Councillor Pearson and seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor? That is carried. On to item 12.3, and the recommendation contained in the report, LS13012, be approved and remain confidential until council approval. So until ratification, Councillor Whitehead moves it, seconded by Councillor Maria Pearson. All in favor? No opposed? None opposed. On 12.4, it's the, the recommendations contained in report LS13016 be approved and remain confidential until council approval. And that is moved by Councillor Partridge and seconded by Councillor Collins? Seconded by Councillor Collins. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. May I have a motion to adjourn? Just kidding. <laughs> We have to go back in our agenda now to our discussion items, and uh, we begin with item 8.1. Um, we're going to uh, invite John Aarons to come forward at this time to speak to the item. Uh, it is a five minute time limit. He uh, did gesture from the gallery much earlier in committee today that he'll only be two, but you still get five, John. You've been patient all day. And then after that, we'll turn to Councillor Collins, who has, I believe, a tabling motion. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you made me have lunch, so now I'm sleepy. I'll be five minutes, but uh, thank you for the opportunity to address committee. I'm here on behalf of the Sisters of St. Joseph's who own uh, almost a 50-acre parcel of land in the Pleasant View area. Just to uh, put things in perspective, um, this is an air photo of their property. It's located at the intersection of Highway 6 and the 403. You, you see the, the rooftops of their buildings as you're driving on the 403. Um, these lands were subject to a provincial plan known as the Parkway Belt West Plan. And in their wisdom, the province has said, we're removing them from the Parkway Belt Plan and we're adding them to the Niagara Escarpment Plan which is fine because it's, it's a provincial plan regardless and, and the Niagara Escarpment Commission is, is well equipped to implement their plan. For the past two years, we've been working closely with the Niagara Escarpment staff and we have come up with a list of uses for this property which the NEC and the sisters are quite happy with. That list has been presented to your staff and in the staff report before you today, it's the City of Hamilton's planning department that's saying, wait a minute, these lists or these uses are too broad, they don't comply with the rural Hamilton official plan and we're not supporting them. I'm here to ask your support of what the Niagara Escarpment uh, Commission staff are, are recommending for this property. So this is just an air photo of the subject property, uh, just to outline the location. Uh, this is a site plan of the property. You see that there are two large building complexes. Um, the larger building complex was built in the early 1950s. It is their convent and uh, it has approximately 93,000 square feet of floor area. It's a three-story building, so it's quite large. And then the other building is uh, uh, also a convent. It is used as uh, the Sisters of Precious Blood, and they have about 26,000 square feet. So all in told, we've got this fairly large, major institutional use happening on this property. Um, as happens with some of these uh, orders, their membership is not as robust as it once was. So they, they have empty space, they have empty rooms available. And, and to, to deal with these issues, they look for partnerships with the community. And, and recently they partnered with Columbia International College and they rented out three floors for their students and that was all approved through our Committee of Adjustment. This is the typical planning hierarchy that, that we have in Ontario. It's, it's called the top-down planning. We have the Niagara Escarpment Plan, we have provincial policies, and then we have the local official plan. 
I, I found it somewhat um, interesting that the staff report is suggesting that the range of uses contemplated for this property are not appropriate because they don't comply with the rural Hamilton official plan. And I think that's backwards. I think the Niagara Escarpment plan sets the range of uses and then that's implemented in the local sector. Uh, clearly the Niagara Escarpment plan is the provincial document. It has precedent. It has trump, if you will, over local planning decisions. And if these uses are adequate by the upper tier authority, being the Niagara Escarpment, um, I, th I think they should also be appropriate at the local level. It's that top-down planning where the Niagara Escarpment Plan sets the standards. And, and I know staff will say, yes, but we can be more restrictive than the Niagara Escarpment. And you can. And to put that in perspective, let's say the Niagara Escarpment Plan said, from this particular environmental feature, we require a 20-meter buffer. You can be more restrictive and require a 30-meter buffer, because doing so does not conflict with that upper tier planning document. When the upper tier planning document is specifically designed to have flexibility, for you to be more restrictive, in my opinion, is not being you know, in line with that intent. The intent is to provide flexibility, not to be restrictive. These list is the list of uses that are supported by the Niagara Escarpment Commission. A place of worship is there today. Uh, day nursery is not. However, many, many school children come to this property now for retreat purposes. Uh, the educational establishment, uh, commercial school, it should say, and school lodging are also permitted uses. A retirement home is permitted today for nuns, not for the general public. We'd like it open up to the general public as well. A hospital health care and medical offices are permitted for the nuns, but again, not for the general public. And, and I think we don't necessarily, if, if those uses are appropriate, then we shouldn't be people zoning them and saying only nuns can use them. It's, it's appropriate for the general public to use them as well. And then the last use that we've asked for is that residential care facility, including a group home. Uh, the, these, these lands are just ideal candidates for these types of uses. I don't like to use the precedent card because I know every application is unique. But just a little bit further up Highway 6 at the bottom of the escarpment is a place called Acadia Candle. And when we look at the staff report, Acadia Candle is given special policies and special provisions. In fact, manufacturing of candles, mini storage, light industrial manufacturing, related admin, business offices, research development, warehousing, uh, are all permitted uses. Yet it has the same green belt designations, the same Niagara Escarpment Plan designations, the same rural Hamilton official plan designations. So if flexibility is okay for a light manufacturing use, certainly flexibility should be okay for a, an institutional use like the sisters have on their property. So with respect, we are asking that Hamilton Council endorse the amendment as proposed by the Niagara Escarpment Commission. Clearly, as we're all familiar with, the Niagara Escarpment Commission is one of the most restrictive land use planning regimes in Ontario. You know, you need development permits. You go through a, a whole process of, of getting development approved. And if they're satisfied that these range of uses are appropriate, um, certainly the city of Hamilton should be as well. And, and again, with respect, we ask that uh, these uses be allowed for this property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, any questions? None? Move to receive the presentation? Move. Oh, sorry, Councillor Pearson was on the list. And did you? I will uh, receive the yeah. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, John. I, I appreciate the information. Um, I've been commu in communication with uh, several residents of my ward, and I think it's with regards to the opportunity of allowing um, school possibly and group home is that correct residential care facility these yes. are for adults who have mental disabilities correct are you um, aware of that that they're hoping to uh, be able to use this facility so i'm i'm anticipating that this is what will help them 
The, through you, Mr. Chairman, the definition of group home is, is wider. It's all encompassing. Right. It could include, you know, mentally handicapped adults. It could include, you know, different kinds of, of, you know, people with Alzheimer's, people that require a group living environment that's supervised. Excellent. Okay, okay. thank you. And I appreciate because I was going to ask a question about Acadia Candle and why that was in here. So I appreciate you explaining it. And uh, certainly I'll second uh, receipt of the presentation, Mr. So Mayor. that is moved by Councillor Whitehead and seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carrie, thank you for your patience you. today, John. Really appreciate that. And we did have um, a staff presentation, but I purposely bypassed it because there is a, a tabling motion, I believe, before us. Councillor Collins. <coughs> Chairman, it's uh, moved by myself and seconded by yes. Councillor Partridge that the item be tabled until the next meeting to allow for consultation with the Ward Councillor and the Sisters of St. Joseph's, the NEC, and City of Hamilton planning staff. Right, and that uh, on consultation is ongoing, and that is moved by Councillor uh, Collins and seconded by Councillor Partridge. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. On to 8.2, enforcement of block swales. Any discussion on 8.2? Councillor Pearson. Are we going to go in right into questions as Mr. Chairman? Because yep. I'm pleased to see this back before us. And um, I just, uh, and also that it's a, a two year pilot program. I guess just going through, uh, through you to staff, and I'm not sure it would be Mr. Hazel. Will we be dealing with Mr. Bariani, who I deal with, George Bariani, will he be involved in this process also? Through Mr. Chairman, that would be our, our resource person that we would go to when we need some technical expertise. Excellent, because he's been great in getting, uh, in being, following up on issues that I've raised in, in the last little while since we brought in the grading and drainage uh, process. Um, I want to ask also, when we mention on page two of three of, of Appendix A, it says that commences enforcement by issuing an order. Is this similar to our property standards? So that would be an order that goes on the door, a $245 charge? Mr. Chairman, that would be, yes, very similar to property standards or would, would not be placed on the door, it would be registered letter. That's fine. I'm not, I, I know I've had the issue with how we deliver it, but there is, are we saying there would be a charge then with this order or no? And my reason for the question. For Mr. Chairman, Glenn White will talk okay, to you more about the enforcement you. detail. I just want to be sure because going forward, I, I know the issues that I have in my ward, it may not be one property, it can be four properties that are creating a problem. So who are we going to target? Is it all of them, one of them? So, so through Mr. Chairman, just to be clear, this, this proposal is for where there's easily identifiable obstructions. So where someone has built a shed or a patio that's obstructing a swale, we can clearly identify. Where there's a number of properties involved, we're not sure where the violation is actually starting, that would, be not covered, that would not be covered by this pilot. So then let me get clarification. I'm dealing with one right now on Peachwood where we there is a there is a recognized swale. It's not an easement that the city has control over, but residents have filled in the back of this swale. I was just on site after the last rainstorm. There's two or three properties that have filled in. So you're saying that that, and there's a catch basin somewhere down the way, but because they filled in the swale, the water can't get to it. So are so, you saying they have no avenue to go after? So through Mr. Chairman, that's why it's a pilot because some of these can be very difficult to resolve. The intention is, is where an officer can go out through an observation, identify the obstruction, identify the violator, then we would take appropriate action. So it sounds like in the situation you're talking about, although I don't know the detail, that it's, uh, it's easy to identify, then we would be able to take enforcement action. So one of the key measures is, is to identify the proportion of complaints, the portion of complaints that we can deal with. Uh, is this going to really help us with the problem of block swales or is it just going to touch the tip of the iceberg? Okay, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Um, my next question then is continuing down on Appendix A. Further down, we're saying that we're going to register the order on title. Could you just clarify? I've never, I've never um, come across this before on, on a process like this. Under, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, under uh, property standards, <clears throat> when we issue an order, in some cases where um, the order is not complied with for whatever reason, and one of the options that we can do is to 
put it on title, put the order on title and advise the property owner this is one of the actions we're going to be taking because they haven't complied. So we're hopeful that telling them that would cause them now to remove those set of set obstructions because there wouldn't be a need to place it on title if they're going to clear it away. But it's one of the options we could do. We could also take them to court, charge them on the property standards bylaw in addition to placing it on title. So it, there's different steps and stages. I'd rather not put it on title immediately. I think that's an option that we could consider later on when we find someone's being challenging and difficult. Okay. Um... So what I want to ask is, um, I just want to ask them, if we registered on title, how does it clear, get cleared off of title once it's, once it's addressed? I'll call you right back. Well, first of all, they can't sell the, uh, the house until they discharge that, that, that's on title. So in order for them to remove that from title, they have to make, they come to us with the deed, with a, with a letter saying that they, they want to, um, sell the property, they want to remove it from title. We take that, we forward it over to the legal department. The legal department will do the research and then approve it, removal off title, but the person that comes forward will have to pay a fee of $500 to have that removed off title. Thank you, and that was my second concern. Um, I, I understand and agree that we need to deal with these, but I also want to be sure that staff are a little cautious. I mean, these are huge fees, and I've been having my issues with a lot of building department issues recently where we just say, you know what, you need this. Every time we tell somebody they need this, there's huge costs on the other side of this, and I'm concerned of if it, are we using a sledgehammer as opposed to a, a stick in dealing with it. So I'm just saying let's be cautious because $500 in order to clear this off title then it becomes a legal issue of you've got, um, you know, you've got issues of, of a clouded title, et cetera, and selling it. So I'm just wanting to be very cautious going forward. I understand we need to deal with this and I'll be more than happy to work with residents that contact me and residents that I know I have issues with and making sure that they take care of these so they don't end up having a cost. So just that's my caution, Mr. Chairman. The, other, the only other part is we're saying that we have a cost recovery from fines. Where, what are the fines or where are the fines because I don't see it here. Are they under the set fines? There are no set fines that uh, we would take them to court and then whatever fine they would receive at court. So it could be under the Provincial Offences Act and those fines can range from a, a suspended sentence through conditional discharge to a small fine to a fine up to $10,000, which is, I've never seen that occur, but you can get a fine a certain amount. So can we clarify that in this appendix that it's uh, fines that can be um, adjudicated through court because it's not a fine through our through our system through our a set fines uh, act or whatever. So, so, Mr. Chairman, we can clarify it. We were just basically wanted your permission. Any fees or fines we generate would go back into the reserve to recover okay. some of the costs. So I would appreciate if that could be clarified so that they realize if somebody pulls it out, they should know. And last but not least, Mr. Chairman, through you, can I please encourage staff that we advertise, publicize this direction going forward so that the public is aware of it. And I'm not just saying the brochures, which are great that we have, but we need to get this out in the paper so that residents are aware whether it goes on. I don't think there's time now to catch the next tax bill, but residents need to know going forward. And yeah, you know, I, I understand that it's a matter of let's get the problem areas fixed and hopefully as these get fixed, we don't have as many problems. So, sir, Mr. Chairman, we haven't thought a lot about the detail, but we'd be pleased to take some direction, do some educational and information campaigns as part of this. Is it helpful to you, Councillor Pearson, uh, item A, uh, Roman numeral three, any proceeds from associated fees and charges be directed back to the reserve? I have no problem with that, Mr. Chairman. I just, well, unless staff would prefer that goes back into the parking reserve directly it is because that's where it's coming reserve. out of. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I have no problem with that. I okay. just want to be sure the public are aware this is what they're going to get hit with. Thank you. Very good line of questioning and uh, a clear interpretation of the report. Councillor Partridge. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'd be pleased to move uh, uh, this report after I make a couple of comments here. But I, uh, sorry, I have a question actually for staff. Um, on the terms of reference, it, it uh, 
refers to there will be an offer of mediation to the affected parties, and that would be by the officer. Um, can you, staff, Marty, could you just explain the sequence of events? So would the mediation happen first, and then perhaps the ticket after? Would the ticket be first? So through Mr. Chairman, this is just sort of outline our process and the officers always have the discretion on if there's a violation on how to solve the problem through an order, through charges. Uh, in many cases we find that these are clearly resulting from neighbors' disputes. They pile stuff in this well because they're mad at their neighbor. If the officer the concern to be generated by a neighbor's dispute, we may offer mediation in an attempt to resolve the situation rather than to charge and go through the courts. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that. I, I, I think that's a, a really um, an important component to have in the terms of reference. I know certainly the complaints that we get in many cases, it's a swing set that's put up, it's a shed that's been put up, uh, and uh, it, you know it's affecting all the, the property owners down the way. So I'm very pleased to see this come forward and the fact that it is a pilot uh, project. Um, my last question, and I, and I apologize if, if this was asked and answered before, but the full-time, uh, the one full-time employee, will that be an existing staff member? Was that already covered? Uh, sir, Mr. Chairman, it'll be a full-time employee on, as a temporary position, so we will post it and go through the normal hiring process. At some point, if it is filled internally, we'll create a vacancy somewhere in the organization, but we're not sure how that will be filled yet. Okay, but currently we would go through the process of advertising for it. It's not an existing uh, employee. It's not Thank an existing you. employee. We would start advertising internally first. All right, and uh, so thank you very much. And um, Mr. Chair, I'd be very pleased to move this uh, at the appropriate time. Okay, great. And the cost also includes uh, 40K for the transportation, which will ultimately include, I guess, after today, an AVL system. Right. Councillor Whitehead. Order of this pilot in front of us because it's an issue that I think impacts all of us. Uh, I need some clarification, though. Um, because I've had issues where um, sheds are put on top of catch basins and yards. This, this is just dealing with swales. So does that suggest then we already have the, the, the procedures and, and policies in place to go after people that actually block catch basins? Through Mr. Chairman, we do currently have a provision in the property standards bylaw to deal with blocked catch, catch basins and private drains, so that's fine. We also have some provisions in the property standards bylaw to deal with storm water, but they're not clear enough that, that they would hold up in court when related to swale, so we need to tighten up the bylaw, and this pilot will specifically deal with swale enforcement. Perfect, thank you for the explanation, thank you. Thanks for the quick turnaround. It was uh, this committee and Councillor Ferguson that brought this forward and you guys have uh, worked uh, uh, fairly quickly on this one. Councillor Pearson for a second time. Mr. Chairman, yes, thank you. And I just, just wanted to clarify. I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify. And this is block swales that are recognized swales. Because I have a lot of areas in my ward that they are not recognized swales. There were never any swales, but residents believe that there were and there's absolutely nothing we can go after. I just want to be sure that we're not getting staff caught in, in a, a Through Mr. Chairman, yes, that is correct, and that's why we're going to need to have Tony's crew to give us some, uh, some information on a lot okay. of these situations. Perfect, thank you. Seeing no further questions, then let's move to uh, approve the recommendation. That's moved by Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. Sorry about that. Moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor? It's carried. Any opposed? It's carried. And uh, we added 8.3 to today's agenda. I need somebody to move to lift PED 13043 or do we just lift it? Somebody want to move to lift it from the uh, table? Yeah. We'll move uh, that. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. And that's seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Any opposed? So we've lifted PED 13043 from the table and now looking to pass a motion to amend uh, the, uh, the, the recommendations on amend, amending, I believe. Uh, Councillor. Okay, yes, that's right. Councillor Partridge now. Yes, the wallflower. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so it is moved by myself and seconded by uh, Councillor Pasuda, and it's item 8.3. It's attached. Uh, 
I'll wait till you have it. I'll wait for you to catch up. It's okay. Carry on. He'll find it. <laughs> I, Vanessa's going to help him there. Anyway, um, so back in, in March, this uh, application from Brand Haven and Rosart uh, Developments came forward and was referred back to staff that we would meet with uh, myself, the ward councillor, and Brant Haven Homes. And I'm very pleased to say that um, we have been able to have a great deal of communication with the residents on their concerns and have uh, um, met with Brant Haven Homes. And I want to thank staff in particular who uh, provided a great deal of guidance for me on this. The residents are, are quite happy because it uh, has been reduced down to 44 townhouse units and as well one of the big issues was this development which is on the corner of Parkside Drive and Hamilton Street proposed for that corner would have been connected to Trudell Circle which is a street uh, behind and that was something that the residents on Trudell Circle were most concerned about be, uh, for obvious reasons the additional traffic that would be flowing through their neighborhood and traffic is a big concern in Waterdown and I've been certainly beating that drum for the longest time. So I was very pleased. We did send additional letters out to all the residents and uh, you know outlining what the options were and uh, they came back and they said if we would um, close off any access for vehicle traffic to Trudell Circle that they certainly didn't have a problem with the development. We know development is going to be on that corner. We were able to get it reduced and as well I must say a big thank you to Brand Haven Homes because they did put additional parking spaces. So instead of 12 parking spaces, we now have a total of 18 parking spaces. And, um, you know, certainly that is going to be a challenge on that corner, but it does make it uh, a little bit better. And in, with no vehicle access to Trudell Circle, there will, however, be a pedestrian access. And um, that was seen as being something important as well. The one access, uh, two accesses, I should say, on to Parkside Drive, uh, the one was going to be quite close to the intersection. And um, we were able to come to an agreement that it would be a one-way uh, right one way in right and one way out right um, so that uh, there would be no left turns and as well there will be a median that will be built uh, on the road just before the intersection which will make sure the vehicles are compliant with that direction. So all in all the residents are pleased and I'm certainly very pleased as the ward councillor that we were able to bring all the parties together and to do what I consider to be good community planning and involve uh, involve all the, the interested parties. I particularly want to uh, mention Sean and Jason at uh, Brand Haven. You, uh, you did a very good job and I appreciate the public meetings that we did have as well. And uh, my residents certainly appreciate getting the additional information and uh, you answering all their questions. So I'm very pleased to move this with uh, Councillor Pasuda seconding it. Thank you. All in favor? Yeah. Any opposed? Great work, Councillor. You are no wallflower, as far as I'm concerned. And we're on to motions, committee. Any motions? There's none. On to notices. Yours is a notice, I believe. Yeah, I have Councilor a notice of motion. I think everybody got this in their Blackberry uh, a while ago. And I'd like to waive the rules, please, seconded by Councillor Pearson. Motion to waive the rules is seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Seeing none. Carry on as a motion. Okay, my motion is whereas the Stony Creek Urban Boundary Expansion, SCOOBY, is a very large secondary planning process that will increase the population of the area by an estimated 17,000 residents. And whereas this secondary planning process was started before amalgamation by the former city of Stony Creek, and whereas a very large number of residents of Stony Creek and Winona have expressed a concern to attend attend the public meetings and also to be included in the process. And whereas a precedence has been set to hold public meetings in the community if large number of residents are expected to attend. Therefore, as local councillor, 
of Ward 11, request that the Planning Committee hold a special public meeting at the Stony Creek Municipal Building at 777 Highway 8, Stony Creek, to accommodate the discussion and public hearing for the Stony Creek Urban Boundary Expansion Report. And if I can speak to that, please. Thank you. Thank you. I've been asking for this since before Christmas, um, and, I, and I don't know whether everybody just heard the previous speaker up here who said that this has been a long time coming, which means that it has generated interest for over 10 years. It's going to change the face of this community forever. We're not talking about a small community project. This thing is 4.5 kilometers. This is not citywide issues such as the licensing rental. Um, it's more like the turtle ponds and this is what we went out to Stony Creek for before was so that people in the immediate area could come out to hear the public um, uh, meeting, be a part of the public meeting, and uh, I would really appreciate if we could entertain this for my for my uh, constituents, my residents. It's free parking out there. There's lots of space. Uh, I appreciate that this is taking everybody out of their comfort zone as far as attending meetings is concerned. Um, but I would really appreciate your support in this. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I absolutely know what the, the good counselor is wanting to do. Um, public consultation is important, um, you know, I, especially with uh, with City Council. Um, the, the, the issue that, uh, that I have would be twofold. Number one, just in um, moving staff out there and just the logistics and setting up the meeting. But I think the other thing that is important that I need to note for residents of Flamborough, we no longer have a municipal service centre. It was this council in the last term of council that voted to tear down that building and yes, Eventually, we're going to be getting a new, much-needed library, which will be absolutely beautiful. But we don't have anywhere to hold public meetings. And we have an enormous amount of development going on out in Waterdown. And, you know, I too hear um, uh, from folks, geez, I have to come all the way down to City Hall, and sometimes they object to the 9.30 meeting time, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, most often it's just the travel of coming down to City Hall. But it is what it is, and we have have our meetings in this building. Um, so I, I do absolutely understand what uh, what it is that you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. I would love to have the opportunity, I think, in the future to do that for my residents too, but that is never going to happen. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts. I, I can't support it. Okay, Councillor Pearson. Chairman, thank you, and I, and I certainly understand where Councillor Johnson's coming from. This is more than just, and I apologize, but as far as my understanding and my historical context, this is no, this is not the turtle ponds. The turtle ponds was a specific zoning right. issue. This is not the turtle ponds issue. And we did hold a public meeting in Stony Creek, and we've never done one since. Um, I would say this is more because it, it involves pretty well half of Stony Creek. And that's the whole issue and the reason that I would second this motion is it's not just a specific, it is the whole, pretty well the whole community moving forward of Stony Creek, Winona for the next 20 years. And that's, that's the rationale that I am supporting this or I agree with my colleagues that have issues. We, we all went around this table several times in the last few terms saying, you know, there's issues with having meetings out in the various communities with regards to specific zoning issues. This isn't just a specific zoning issue. This is a broad picture of a secondary plan. So that is the reason that I seconded it. I just wanted to make sure, for the record, my turtle pond zoning was to do with specific property. And I would, I would not ask that that be changed going forward, that zoning issues in my ward go to the community and I have meetings in Stony Creek, I would continue to support them to be here. But this is not the same context, Mr. Chairman, and I certainly understand where Councillor Johnson is coming from. Thank you. Councillor White. Thank you, but nothing more uh, impactful than the rural uh, official plan or the urban official plan which took place right here in this very uh, chambers, which impacted more people than this particular proposal could ever impact. And this is where it was decided to, to, to host those discussions. I tried to, and I, 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 I knew that we tried to move um, discussions to other uh, locations, and we did that in the past. I did try to move something on the mountain in regards to uh, uh, meetings as well, and I was told we no longer do this. 
I'm not sure if that was through resolution. I don't know if I missed that meeting, but they told we don't no, we no longer do this. So I guess my concern is either we do or we don't, but if we start uh, uh, the slippery slope piece, then I need to know now so that I can go back to my residence and say, well, the rules have changed again. So uh, I don't have a problem supporting this, but my then, I, then we open the door. As far as I'm concerned, we open the door because I don't think it's fair to, 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 to treat one area of the community any different than any other community, regardless if it's an individual application or a larger application. There's impl I was told when I tried to do it that there's implications to overtime, staffing, uh, logistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those uh, are worth part of the consideration, as I understand it, why they arrived at the conclusion that we will no longer be, uh, this is the center of governance. We've got over the sensitivities of the, uh, of the outlying areas. We've been working very well together. Uh, I was told that this is where, uh, we, you know, when you do cons consultation, you can go up to the community and so forth, but when we deal with formal planning act issues, this is where it's going to take place because this is the, uh, the center of governance. Uh, so I guess I, the, my position is if we support this today, then I'm going to be uh, uh, moving that we open it up and we start moving everybody around for every application that is very impact, impactful in individual areas. If we don't do that, then we should stay here. Right. Reminds me of, I think your name was, I'm up next, sorry, we'll pass the chair and then uh, um, I'll, I'll pass it to yeah, Councillor no Partridge. Go ahead. Vice, uh, second vice. Yep. Um, I think it was Miss Forward in grade three. Little Timmy, if I let you go to the bathroom, then I got to let everybody else. And I was the first thing I thought of. I was a little concerned about that myself. Um, and suddenly, our, our, our committee meetings here at the the Center of Governance uh, become regular road shows. And I, no disrespect, completely understand where you're coming from, and uh, completely understand the gravity of the uh, issue for you. I also understand you to be councillor, uh, very good at holding community meetings on your own. You mentioned earlier today in committee that that you've already had two public meetings with respect to a school. On an issue such as this, I'm assuming that you would have and hold uh, at least that amount uh, for something of this significance as you stressed here in the motion as well. I don't know where I heard it, but if I can through you, um, a Chair, to the Councillor, the mover of the motion, ask was, I thought I heard or saw somewhere that the evening was to be an evening meeting. Is that true through the Chair? Councillor? No, all I'm asking is to hold a special council meeting or a special public meeting. It doesn't have to be in the evening. Okay. It can be starting at one o'clock and move on like we've done for others. Okay. So, and and again, I'm just worried about you know. Um, I don't even want to refer to it in a derogatory fashion because I do appreciate where you're coming from, the, but the piling on effect and uh, all things considered that this is uh, you know a standing committee of council and most standing, if not all standing committees occur here in uh, council chambers. This is also uh, being the Ward 2 councillor and this is where I have an obvious advantage over you when it comes to major meetings like this. I've had town halls in this very room regarding community manners, but we have matters. We have uh, um, a transportation hub here in downtown Hamilton. It's not hard to get to. There is, I hear it all the time, plenty of surface parking lots and plenty of parking in the near vicinity. And um, it is a matter of uh, extreme significance and importance. So often what I've noted in my short time here as a representative of the people of Ward 2 is that if it is a significant and important matter, uh, people make a concerted effort to be part of the meeting and they take the time off as, as inconvenient as that can be uh, to be at uh, the place where the meeting is being held and uh, I, you know I, I just want you to be, understand that um, um, it's about for me and then when I first saw it counselor uh, opening the door and, and then and then who knows and you know the previous speaker already alluded to it and I think it's a, the potential for this is something that you may have already uh, contemplated so based on on the the facts that uh, you're very good at uh, bringing your community together if you were to share with me and I think I can speak for a large number of these committee members how those meetings played out the attendance the comments graphs whatever you want to present I would take those into consideration a hundred percent and appreciate where they're coming from uh, and uh, in my experience as well you could do a, a much better job uh, by um, um, bringing in staff having your own meeting and letting your community uh, work intimately more intimately with you and of course they're always welcome when it comes time to become a uh, uh, 
uh, a committee agenda here for uh, Councillor uh, Chambers. So if you were to hold one or two or three public meetings, I might also suggest, and I've done this many times before and he's available for hire, but you can even live stream these meetings. Joey Coleman's over here to my left and he can record live uh, tape. You can keep the tape and we could use that as evidence as well. But unfortunately, uh, and I hate to beleaguer it, but uh, I, I just can't for those reasons uh, uh, support what's before us. So thank you. And I will take the chair back. Councillor Collins is next. Um, and actually, if you would add, um, sorry, Councillor, if you would add Councillor Pasuda to that list, please. And, and Councillor Johnson as a second time. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, and I. Um, I, I don't think any of us are opposed to uh, nighttime meetings or uh, certainly meeting with the community. That's part of the jobs. You know, we do more of that outside of the standing committee process than uh, than we do in a forum like this. And so it's, you know, if you're in this job for any length of time and uh, you want to do it well, you need to meet with people after hours. And so that's part of life. So I don't think anyone here is um, opposed to meeting with people uh, after the dinner hour. That's just a fact of life when you're an elected representative. Having said that, um, you know, it was just over a decade ago that in this same forum I asked our staff uh, for the very same reasons that Councillor Johnson has raised. Um, I, I was growing a little bit uh, concerned about some of the uh, cherry picking that we were doing for some of the issues where I know we had a very large meeting in Ancaster one term. We've had several out in Stony Creek related to development issues. And, um, and as Councillor Johnson mentioned, we've had uh, other meetings uh, related to the landlord licensing issue that we, we held a large, very large meeting over there at the Convention Centre, although that wasn't the standing committee process. And so at times we've sort of cherry picked and one of the complaints that I received from, from my community was, well, uh, you know, my planning application might be just as important as an urban boundary expansion and airport development, aerotropolis uh, issue. And so there was, um, the question came up, well, what's the city's policy on this? And, and many of us advocated for uh, nighttime meetings outside of this building because it, it is probably the most common complaint that we receive, not just in planning, but for those people who attend public works meetings, audit administration. The complaint is that they're taking time off work or away from their families um, to attend these meetings and, and it's inconvenient, uh, but that happens to be the time that there are regular working hours. That's when we're conducting our business. And so the question was put to um, our staff at the time, and again, this was almost a decade ago, how do we make that work? And if memory serves me right, and I didn't bring the report today, but if memory serves me right, there were all kinds of logistical issues in terms of what issues then would be put on the agenda to be held outside of this meeting, a building at, a, at another place after hours. And I thought I heard from staff verbally, and I believe it was in a written form on more than one occasion that this has come to us, that there were overtime issues and logistics in terms of securing the many staff people that we see fill the gallery every time we have a planning meeting, as well as the length of the meetings. And so, as you can imagine, I can certainly understand and probably guess how many people will line up to speak to us at this kind of a meeting, as they do uh, with some of the other contentious issues that Councillor Johnson and uh, Councillor Whitehead raised with his brow lands. I mean, we sat here for uh, at least seven or eight hours on one application. And so if that meeting starts again at uh, seven o'clock in the evening, it probably means scheduling it over two evenings because we're not gonna go past the 11 or 12 o'clock hour. And so those kinds of logistical issues were brought forward to the committee. And if I can just ask through you, either to Mr. Mallet or, or um, Mr. McCabe, um, you know, our, are there opportunities, do those same issues still hold true today as it relates to trying to organize um, these types of one-off events? Let's call it. Um, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. So I think the issues are the same. I think the report was actually done by, by uh, the clerk's department, Alexander Rawlings, about all the issues and overtime even in clerks and the logistics of bringing uh, uh, all the material there. And yes, we have union planners that would have to be paid overtime. But it's really a governance issue, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, and uh, you know, it's up to the committee. We have had meetings, but I can count, I've been here 12 years, 13 years. Uh, probably on one hand, I can count the number of meetings we've had. So what I, what I would ask, 
I, I think, you know, just the, the comments that have been made is everybody's sympathetic because it is a common complaint and it speaks to the whole issue that we're without a policy. Without, we're without a policy that speaks to how we would pick and choose what planning issues would be held. We heard certainly Councillor Johnson appropriately describe this as a uh, an issue that's going to uh, completely impact the way that uh, Stony Creek is developed over the next uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years and beyond. We heard from Councillor Whitehead earlier in terms of the uh, Browlands issue where there was, I mean, we had petitions off the desk probably uh, four or five inches high. And we had, I know that the councillor held several community meetings that generated a lot of discussion. And I could tell you that even for a small planning application, I had my Lozani property on Green Hill that eventually went to the board and we were victorious, but I could have packed this chamber several times over had I held that meeting uh, during the evening hours at a location close to the neighborhood. And so there's, you know, there are certain um, issues I think that we need to resolve. Uh, again, uh, no one's opposed to meeting at night. It, it happens three or four times a week for all of us and no one's opposed to meeting with residents because when we have those meetings, we're meeting with residents and interested stakeholders. The question becomes how and when, at what point in time is it appropriate then to schedule these meetings has been requested and we need a policy for that. And, and we, don't just, we don't just need it at planning, we need it at public works, we need it at an audit at a min, and um, we need it at uh, community services as well. And possibly even for GIC, many of the meetings that uh, I believe the, um, the Aerotropolis meetings were, were GIC meetings, if memory serves me right. So, you know, I'm a little reluctant to support sort of these one-offs because I, like others, have said to my constituents, that's the process that we have. We're willing to change the process. I have no problem debating that. In fact, I'd welcome the opportunity to move our meetings around the community in a very structured way, a very predictable way, and uh, then we could advertise to our residents, here's when we um, hold meetings during the evening hours or in other buildings other than City Hall. And, and uh, you know, here's the test, here's the criteria that, um, that explains why we do it that way. And so I'm, uh, I'm certainly, uh, I'm, you know, I, I feel awkward in that I, I certainly don't want to oppose what's in front of us, but I, in the absence of having a structured policy, it makes it very difficult to support what's in front of us. Thank you, Councillor. Second time. Oh, Councillor Pasuda, first time speaker. Thank you, Chairman Farr. And Councillor Collins uh, virtually said almost everything I wanted to say. And I was going to ask staff the question about meetings and policy. And I can remember the one we had on the uh, with Councillor Whitehead for the Browlands. And uh, it was a long meeting, a lot of staff. And I remember the comments a few days after and in ongoing weeks about uh, staff time, overtime, how many people got dragged up there and all the documents that were there and it, it was an issue and, and I don't like really haven't been following it what the policy was but I do know it can drag on and, and I was going to ask Councillor Johnson but this is a special one-off meeting just to deal with this. It's not a regular planning meeting we're looking at through you Mr. Chairman. Quick. Councillor Johnson. No. Special meeting and, and uh, an evening meeting was that what it was through you Mr. Chair? A full, a full yeah, I need you to get on the mic. So the question's through the chair to you, no, Councillor Johnson. There's, no, the first there's question. no reference whatsoever to a nightly meeting, but let me warn you right now, it'll end up being in the night anyway, so overtime shouldn't even be an issue here because it's going to be overtime. We're going to start at 9.30. I'll guarantee you we will not get out of this building until late at night. Okay. Uh, um, thank you. I'm done. Second time speakers, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, and I've listened very carefully to what everyone was saying. Um, I tried to move it, couldn't get it moved. I will never be able to have one in mind, and I'm even given coaching over here how to be a good counselor. I really appreciate that. But as I said, I'm not asking for an evening meeting. I'm asking for the planning committee meeting to be moved to another location, closer to where the residents of the, of the community, where this is going to impact them the most. And make no mistake, this will be an overtime meeting. Whether we have it here or we have it in Stony Creek, it will be over time because I'll, I'll guarantee you if I if I take one-third of the of the emails that I've been getting and staff have been getting um, if one-third of those people show up it's going to be a long day so thank you and if we don't uh, follow this and we don't and this does not pass uh, then I would like to put another motion forward that we started at one o'clock in the afternoon instead so that we will allow people to come and knowing that we will be here all day and, and part of the evening to listen to them. Thank you. 
Councillor Collins, followed by Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, I'm in a position where I could only support it if this if this if this issue is forwarded to the governance committee for some kind of resolve. Um, you know, this haphazard way of doing things uh, can't continue because it's it's not fair to other people who are from other areas who clearly said. You know, I want that planning meeting in my neighborhood, and I want it after hours. I, uh, you know, I'm glad to hear that we'd stick to the 9:30 rule, um, which is uh, somewhat comforting, knowing that staff have consistently raised some issues. But this issue has to go to governance because it's it's too open-ended, and there needs to be some structure to it. Because otherwise, we'll have the very smallest of planning applications to the very largest of ones, and um, we'll end up finding ourselves because we've done it for one member, and now another is asked. I, I don't know where you start to draw the line in terms of determining the weighted importance of a planning issue. All the planning issues and all the public consultation is, is worth the same as it relates to public uh, input. So I'm, uh, I'm only supporting it if in fact there's a part B that says that it be referred to governance. With the sort of understanding around this table that until something comes back from governance we're not going to continue to move this around the city until we have a, a good debate with some good information from staff. Councillor Collins, are, uh, while you spoke, though you didn't ask a question, the clerk looked like uh, she wanted to uh, add to that. Vanessa? Just for some clarification, so are you saying that we are putting a new stipulation in that this only if this be referred to the governance committee, or perhaps maybe it's better to have a separate motion to put forward that a governance review committee be directed to um, put policy standards in for meetings to be held outside and keep the issues separate for clarity. And we just vote on the recommendation or the motion as it. Councillor Collins? Okay. Councillor Whitehead. I, I, yeah, I appreciate it. And again, uh, good work with the, the, the council. I can appreciate where she's coming from, but it is uh, a bit of a Pandora's box. And I think Councillor Collins nailed it. No application is not important to the people it impacts. I don't care if it's 7,000, I don't care if it's 5,000, I don't care if it's 300. Each and every one of those individuals will be equally impacted every time an application comes in and there needs to be a clear defined policy before we start making uh, 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 the exceptions. I supported this process until I realized the cost, the logistics and so forth. I'm one when I chaired, tried to move I think at least six meetings throughout the, uh, the city. That was at a different time, and that was certainly uh, uh, clear when we had reports back what it was costing, the impact it was having on staffing. Uh, information means anyone can hold. Any counselor can go and hold uh, an information meeting, and if they're blessed with a, a, a facility uh, like in Stony Creek, they can have the community meeting and have information uh, discussions and create really good framework for this planning committee. But when you're talking about a statutory planning meeting, it's a little different because you've got statutory responsibilities. So uh, I, I have concerns that we're now we're going to take something that's more of all directly under the Planning Act outside of the information piece and uh, getting into really what councillors are, are, are doing and are doing a very good job and that's engaging their community through uh, the information meetings. So. Um, I like the idea of uh, governance. I think we do uh, need to keep it uh, uh, separate. I'm not sure what the timing of this is. If, if the timing is such that we can move along on the governance thing and have something come back with a set of policies and then make a decision on, on, the, on this particular decision, I'm okay with it. But if you're asking me to make a decision in advance of all that, I'm having a bit of a challenge. So uh, I think it would be prudent for us to allow the process to unfold and to do that, uh, that very thing. Councillor Pearson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I sit on Governance Committee and I, I agree with the clerk. I think we need to keep this separate. I don't want to wrap it up and I don't think we can afford the timelines to delay this to arrange a meeting because then it just creates a whole other quagmire of issues. I think let's deal with this motion. Whatever falls here, I'd be happy to bring the issue to Governance Committee. I think we did deal with this in the past, but I can't recall it off the top of my head. Thank you. I know we had council position, so thank you. Any other speakers? Seeing none. So the motion is before us. Um, moved by Councillor Johnson and seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Opposed? And it's defeated with four to three. Uh, further to this issue and on the matter of governance as a whole,
Councillor Collins, what have you formulated? The, uh, I move that the Governance Committee um, investigate and report back to GIC with a template that seeks to address Standing Committee and GIC meetings held at locations other than City Hall. And that's seconded. Locations across the city other than City Hall. Second by Councillor Pearson. Any debate, talk, conversation? All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. Still with notices of motion, I have one. Just a notice that uh, Municipal Law Enforcement Staff, Property Standards Division, uh, report back to this committee at no fixed date. So it could be when Glenn's out west. Uh, with respect to how our hospital staff, primarily maintenance staff, deal with the issue of unsightly cigarette butts on the periphery of their property and uh, also as it includes city property. That's just a notice moved by myself. Anybody else with a notice of motion? Sorry. Yes, sorry. Yeah. You want to move them all on the outstanding business list? Yes. Councillor Pearson? Item F, we have to do we have to pick a date through you, Mr. Chairman, to Vanessa? Uh, no, we actually dealt with that today. It was eight point oh, right. three, so we're just gonna be re remove that. So remove <laughs> item F and then the rest I'll move to the new dates. I'll second it. All in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Okay. Notes from the uh, GM? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So we're trying to plan these June meetings. I told these guys don't plan anything controversial if it's going to be on the same meeting as a, as a Scooby situation. So we were just talking about that. So uh, just a couple things. Al Fletcher has now become... Uh, or why he wanted it, but permanent uh, in terms of the manager licensing position because he was in an acting position. So uh, that, that's good. And uh, Al. Can you speak right into the mic, Tim? Sorry. Oh, take it, take saying, it from the top. Yeah, so Al Fletcher is now permanently the manager licensing. Um, he was in an acting position before that. So Glenn White is leaving, I believe, at the end of this week. But uh, I think Marty's twisted his arm to kind of hang around for some trans transitional stuff for a couple of months. Uh, and there is a send off that we're planning. Uh... <laughs> He's laughing. I think he paid him under the table or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so they're uh, planning a send off on, on June 13th. So uh, certainly uh, we appreciate all the work and leadership that Glenn has brought to, to enforcement. Uh, um, I was in Chicago last week. Uh, um, Mr. Chair for the American Planning Association Conference. I know Sam Barilla always goes to this, but I don't know. I didn't see him there this year. But if you ever wanted to go to a conference, it is packed with choices, and not just from a planning planning perspective. So the American Planning Association, there's so many choices for mobile workshops and other types of workshops. So I concentrated a bit on it. I was very fascinated with the uh, tax incremental financing that they do down the state. So we don't have the legislation here, but I know the province is looking at it. And it was just a fascinating concept for neighborhood strategy development. And, and uh, you know, they looked at, you know, impoverished areas too, in terms of how to pick up the, uh, the employment base and the business base. And so the concept we do on a project basis so somebody's building a hotel, the difference between the pre-assessment and the post-assessment, they get rebated that increase in assessment or increase in taxes for you know, 90% the first year, 70% up to six years. So down in the states, it's done on a neighborhood basis. So all the, all the assessment increases from the day the tax, the TIF bylaw is passed is frozen. To, and it's like a 20 year tax incremental financing. So all the assessment increases within a ward or a neighborhood gets put into a uh, tax incremental financing uh, pot. And that can be used to provide grants to developers, to build uh, malls, to build community centers, to build, you know, upgrade infrastructure, to help out uh, residents with grant programs. It's an amazing concept. And uh, so the, Chicago's got 38 TIF areas. And you're talking two, three hundred million dollars 
that's in a fund just for a certain neighborhood. And now there's a downside, obviously, because, you know, the global tax situation for the city, they're not getting that increased assessment. Um, so it's amazing what Chicago and some of the other states can do with this type of legislation. And uh, um, so I was very interested in that. And I did do some social media um, workshops as well. And, and just on this point, uh, Ed Vanderwent is, is looking at some QR codes for his inspection vehicles. Um, so we're trying to, you know, use and engage ourselves as a as a department uh, in some of the new social media and technology to to look for better ways to engage the public. So these QR codes are actually going to have, you know, when do you need a building permit? Permits for uh, swimming pools? Uh, are you building a deck kind of thing? So we're going to start reaching reaching out uh, with uh, some of the QR codes and some of the apps. Uh, um, you know, we're already into tw tw Twitter in terms of tourism and ECDEV, so I think uh, some of the uh, municipalities down the states are just like so far ahead of us in terms of public engagement. You can go up to uh, a sign that says, um, you know, the city has received an application for such and such, and they got that QR code. You can go right on, you can actually see the development uh, that is proposed the timelines, the public input, the number of parking spots. and So I think you know we will be moving towards that. Uh, I think it's very, very appropriate that we start moving towards uh, the high-tech uh, the high tech world. Um, and, uh, it's quite coincidental, Ms. Jarrett, because I got something from Chris Murray today about new provincial regulations on daycare facilities regarding fencing of standing water. So we heard the delegation today about ponds that all private home daycare and daycare, the municipality or the province who's licensing things has to ensure that there is no ponds or other standing water features uh, with respect to licensed daycare facilities. So that was something I just saw today when we were hearing the delegation. And just lastly, uh, uh, to you, Mr. Chair, uh, Marty says uh, next time you uh, drop off your kids, you're not gonna just get a parking ticket. He's gonna charge you under the idling bylaw as well. So. So just uh, be careful on that. And thank you very much for those minutes. Yes, I'm glad I could add to your uh, account $65. Uh, we have Councillor Collins, then Councillor Johnson. I'm just uh, curious to know, I, it was two or three meetings ago we talked about having that round table discussion about in intensification. And I don't know if we've made any progress on that, whether, whether we're in the process of trying to schedule something with the committee. I don't know if we had anticipated that being a standing committee meeting or a workshop. Any news on that, Tim? Yeah, so, Mr. Chair, we have met on that. We have a working group. Uh, we're going to bring forward at a regular agenda an outline of the, the action plan of the program to get your input before we get into the working groups. Um, we've discussed how to approach it. Should we approach it by certain uh, uses, like all the low rise? Should we approach it by regulation? Should we just do parking first or just townhouses first? So we've had a couple separate meetings on it. I know Steve Robichaud is leading our team. Um, there is discussion at the uh, liaison committee in terms of what they may be wanting to look at, because I still think we need their input as an industry. But we're also looking at, based on some of the committee's suggestions, some of the other industry uh, inputs on how to approach them, the Architects Association, the condominium corporations and that kind of stuff. So we are actively working on it and uh, we're looking at probably the first workshop in the fall after you've given us guidance on the outline of how to approach this. Okay, thank you. Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to update my colleagues on a stockpile that we have concerns with out in my ward. Um, currently it is not being fenced off. It doesn't have silt fencing on it whatsoever. So whenever there's a rain event, mud slides into people's basements. We've had two children now that have been seriously hurt on this because hills are magnets for kids. So I was just wondering if, Tony, you could update us on that situation. Through the chair to the councillor, um, my staff has been advised that the uh, developer is planning on starting to remove the uh, topsoil stockpile. As to the timing, I'm not sure. Uh, we've had some discussion with uh, 
legal as to how we can advance this even further and, and requirements that deal with the uh, the runoff coming off the stockpile. So we have a couple of meetings going forward with the developer, I believe the end of this week, to get some defined timelines. Thank you, Tony, because my understanding is that that stockpile has been sitting there for five years for final grading on all the properties that they're, they're developing, and yet they keep bringing topsoil in from other places and they're not touching it. So I've even offered to personally fund to move that out of the way and just pick a spot in Hamilton and I'll have it moved there because that's how detrimental it's becoming for the safety of the kids in the area. So I'd just like to throw that out there if you can... Please do whatever you can, wave your magic wand, and let's see if we can get rid of this thing once and for all, please. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Mr. Chairman, yes, thank you. My only question, because it was asked of me earlier or late last week, where are we in the status of the development charges review and subcommittee going forward? And is the fee for July, I know we increase every year, we'll be getting report coming forward, I'm sure, before that time. Yeah, so, no, so I threw the chair to the councillor. I believe July is the incremental increase based on uh, the indexing. Uh, as it relates to uh, moving forward with the 2014 bylaw, uh, council has already provided direction in terms of looking at various options to uh, splitting out the areas. Uh, I believe it was Councillor McCaddy at that time. Uh, finance is leading that uh, process, and we're just waiting for the working groups to start on the technical review before they establish the subcommittee uh, with uh, council and the outside stakeholders. Thank you, and I appreciate that, Tony. And uh, so we're just looking at an incremental being what the cost of living right now this year for the July 1st going forward till next year, correct? Through the chair to the council, I believe that's the index that will occur on the anniversary right. date, July. Okay, I just want to be sure, because Mr. Chairman, just for committee and staff's information, I received a call last week from, a, um, I'm not going to say developer, but somebody who's building in, in my ward and uh, looking at development charges, and he's been told that the fees are going to almost double before for July 1st this year, and I said, I don't know where you're getting this information, but somebody's out there conveying that, and that's unfortunate. Just conclude with general information. So, sorry, by, Mr. Um, Chair, on that. So, oh, sorry. Don't forget the public school board has got public meetings to introduce a new school public uh, development charge. So they are they're increasing. Well, they don't have anything right now, so they're going to add to the to the concerns of the development industry. Okay, just a few notes. Uh, first of all, I know it's his kind of town. Chicago is. Uh, with respect to some of the comments made about uh, Chicago by our general manager, Tim McCabe. But I think it's a perfect time to highlight what Tim and his great staff, particularly those in urban renewal, already know. Uh, last week, John Wells, Saturday, I believe, wrote a story about the Barton Charette and uh, our work once again with McMaster University President Dean with this initiative of getting into the community and working with the community. Council has done that, so has the citizenry. And uh, now with the city staff from urban renewal and rethink renewal, Dave Premi and, and Shaker, uh, the, the design charrette with a great addition to this $100,000 commitment from Urban Renewal next year, and uh, in a small way, commitments from the wards three, four, and two councillors of 2500 each, which was ultimately uh, matched by a, an outside uh, funder to provide a virtual planning uh, charrette, uh, an opportunity like no one, including those high-tech folks in Chicago, has ever had before, born from McMaster University, a made in Hamilton opportunity for folks to engage and really truly see in a three-dimensional way a major uh, a major development, we're hopeful, many major developments we're hopeful uh, going forward. And in this, the city where we also have, as a council, endorsed another made in Hamilton innovative feature uh, from PV Labs uh, during our budget process of 200K a year, I believe, for five years to measure traffic flows anywhere and everywhere we want to measure traffic flows throughout this city. My estimation would be that it's going to probably be very successful yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and to the point where uh, PB Labs will be um, um, uh, sharing uh, their abilities across North America, if not the world, with these uh, drone helicopter cameras uh, from PB Labs. So. I uh, appreciate the comments, and one final comment just to Marty Hazel after the uh, 
after uh, uh, allowing Tim to speak for you with respect to my dropping off my boy and, and paying $65 to do so one morning, paying the ticket, by the way, on time and not late. It would have been, I think, 300 if it was uh, six, 60 hours later. Uh, I will be uh, formulating that uh, uh, some amendments to the, the notice of motion, and in two weeks' time, it's going to be a lot more intrinsic, and it will require much staff time and resources when we look at cigarette butts around hospitals. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? <laughs> I'm through with my routine, and I thank staff very much for their time, and obviously the dedicated members of the community who took the time to appear before us today, and all of the committee members move to adjourn. Councillor Pearson, seconded by Councillor Partridge, all in favor? Any opposed? It's carried. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vanessa.